Number 10, Hawkeye. Now I know what you're thinking, Hawkeye is basically the Aquaman of the Marvel world because everyone is just, everyone just kind of brushes him off, you know? But trust me when I say that he is a lot better than you think. Although Clint Barton doesn't actually possess any superpowers, he has always been a major asset to the Avengers or whatever team he's on, honestly. Clint is a master archer, specializing in any type of bow imaginable thanks to years of training, and he's capable of firing multiple arrows at once at a single target in a few seconds, hitting multiple targets in just a few quick strokes, and directly hit small targets in the greatest of distances. Not only that, but he is in peak physical condition for a human, has extraordinary eyesight, is an expert acrobat, and a master at many martial arts. As a part of multiple iterations of the Avengers, S.H.I.E.L.D., the Thunderbolts, and so many more, Clint has helped take down some of the biggest and baddest enemies in the Marvel Universe, despite being a fairly average dude. There's so much more to this character that meets the eye, and I truly feel like he doesn't get all the credit that he's due, so check out his story for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1964's Tales of Suspense, number 57. Number 9, Catherine Pride. Catherine Kitty Pride was leading the normal life of an extremely gifted 13-year-old girl in Deerfield, Illinois, when she began suffering increasingly intense headaches. Little did she know that the headaches were actually a result of Kitty's mutant powers emerging, which is the ability to pass through solid matter. Professor X soon after located her and sought to recruit her as a new member of the X-Men, and she eventually received permission from her parents to join the mutant team. The youngest person to join the X-Men, she was first portrayed as a kid sister to many older members of the group, filling the role of literary foil to the more established characters. She occasionally used the codename Sprite and Ariel, cycling through several uniforms until settling for her trademark black and gold costume. Thanks to her training with the X-Men, she was able to further develop her powers to make them even more useful, as she is now able to use her phasing ability to phase alongside other people, phasing the entire X-Men team once. She can also camouflage herself, and after having a potential release by the Black Vortex, she was resistant to telepathic effects. Despite this immense power, she is low on this list today because she is unable to breathe while phasing, and in order to phase through an object, she has to know it's coming, which has been exploited many, many times. Take a look at her powers for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1980's X-Men number 129. Number 8, Nightcrawler. The son of Mystique and the demon Azazel, Kurt Wagner was never legally adopted by anyone, but was raised within the circus. He grew up in Max Getman's circus, and his two closest friends were his quote-unquote adopted brother and sister, Stefan and Jemaine Sardos. Kurt and Stefan forged a true friendship as they grew older, and Stefan knew that his magical heritage might lure him to evil one day, so Stefan had Kurt promise him a blood oath that if he ever killed without reason, Kurt would kill him as well. Long before his teleportation power emerged, Wagner had tremendous natural agility, and by adolescence he had become the circus's star acrobatic and aerial artist. He also possessed the superhuman agility, the ability to teleport, and adhesive hands and feet. His physical mutations include indigo-colored velvety fur, which allows him to become nearly invisible in shadows, two-toed feet, and three-fingered hands. Also yellowed eyes, pointed ears, and a prehensile tail. He is also immortal due to him sacrificing his soul, which means there are no natural means of killing him anymore. In Nightcrawler's earlier comic book appearances, he is depicted as being a happy-go-lucky practical joker and teaser, and a fan of swashbuckling fiction. Nightcrawler is also a Catholic, and while that's not really emphasized as much as in his earlier comic book appearances, in later depictions, Nightcrawler is more vocal about his faith. As a member of the X-Men and founding member of Excalibur, we have seen Nightcrawler use his abilities in unique and clever ways to battle Spider-Man, the Punisher, Jigsaw, Cutthroat, and so many more. Take a look at Kurt for yourself, starting with 1975's Giant Size X-Men, number one. Number seven, Jubilee. Born and raised in Beverly Hills, California, Jubilation Lee lived a pretty great life, honestly attended an exclusive school, and was believed to have potential to go to the Olympics for gymnastics. After one terrible night, though, Lee lost both her parents and all of the family money, leaving her all alone. She was sent to an orphanage not long after, but ran away and hid in a Hollywood shopping mall, stealing food as much as she could to survive. Jubilee first discovered her mutant power to generate blinding and explosive energy fireworks while running away from mall security. The stress of running away from the security guards caused her to emit a large light energy blast while in a back alley while completely disorienting the man and creating an opening for her to escape. Upon learning about her mutant ability to create fireworks, Jubilee realized she could earn money by using her powers to entertain customers and visitors in the mall, and that's exactly what she did for a while. Now after the Reavers took over the X-Men base and captured Wolverine, Jubilee helped free him and escape, and the two quickly formed a familial bond through a father-daughter type relationship, and this was pretty much her introduction as a member of the X-Men. 
Now obviously there is a lot more to her story, but I will let you figure out exactly what that is for yourself. Now I briefly mentioned her powers before, but to go into a little bit more detail, Jubilee is capable of luminate kinetic explosive light blasting, which she has dubbed fireworks, and these can be used in many forms and for offensive or defensive purposes, such as hitting someone dead on or just blinding an enemy to escape. Check out her skills for yourself in her first appearance in 1989's Uncanny X-Men number 244. Number 6, Wonder Man. One of the Avengers' more troubled team members, Simon Williams. Simon inherited his father's company, Williams Innovations, and ended up running it into the ground with the help of competition from Stark Industries. He was later then arrested for embezzling funds from the company, giving him a bitter hatred for Iron Man that was then leveraged by the supervillain Baron Zemo in a plan against the Avengers. After being given powers by Zemo, however, Simon betrays him and chooses to fight alongside the team he once fought against, the Avengers. The exact nature of his powers isn't always clear, but regardless, this energy gives his body a massive power up beyond the capability of normal humans. One of the powers being, of course, super strength. Wonder Man's strength is said to be on par with Thor and possibly even Sentry. I mean, he was literally able to knock Thor out once with a single punch. And this is a result of experiments by Zemo. Wonder Man is also imbued with ionic energy, giving him super stamina, speed and agility, and also flight and superhuman reflexes, as well as making him pretty much indestructible. Wonder Man can also absorb various forms of energy, including antimatter, and is able to project powerful energy blasts at will, and can even exist as pure energy if he wishes to. Perhaps the biggest quirk of his abilities, however, is that he doesn't actually require any food, water, or oxygen to survive, thanks to his vast reserves of energy. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1964's Avengers, number 9. Number 5, Cersei. A member of the Eternals, Cersei easily ranks as one of the group's most overpowered members and, in my opinion, is one of the most underrated characters in the Marvel Universe in terms of ability. Like many other members of the Eternals, she is tens of thousands of years old, meaning she has seen quite a bit in her time. She officially joins the Earth's Mightiest Heroes in Avengers number 314, partially due to her desire to protect humanity, but mostly because of her fondness for Captain America. Possessing the strength, speed, stamina, and combat skills, and invulnerability you'd expect from the Eternals, it's said that the only way to actually kill Cersei for good is to scatter her atoms about. Also similar to her fellow Eternals, her ability to fire cosmic blasts from her hands. Cersei is somewhat unique amongst her peers due to her strong telekinetic abilities. What cements Cersei as one of Marvel's most powerful heroes, however, is her incredible transmutation ability allowing her to reshape matter at a molecular level. She is considered a fifth level adept at transmutation, which is also the highest possible level. And she has used her power to turn a deviant to rubber, give the Avengers gills, and even disintegrate air itself. It also seems that she can create sentient life, bringing stone statues to life and turning inanimate objects into various animals and creatures at will. Check out her immense power for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1976's Eternals, number three. Number four, Gilgamesh. Often referred to as the Forgotten One, Gilgamesh's heroic exploits have become so legendary over the millennia that he's often referred to as heroes of myth, like Hercules and Gilgamesh, which explains why he just goes by Gilgamesh. He is one of, if not the strongest member of the hidden group of superpowered beings known as the Eternals, an ancient race of genetically altered humans created by the Celestials. Alongside his teammates, he helps shield humanity from the vicious deviants, though Gilgamesh seems to have a very soft spot for just protecting the people of Earth. He joined the Avengers in a time where their membership was at an all-time low, and although his time with them was pretty short-lived, he was an absolutely vital member of the team. While all Eternals are born with an inherent set of superhuman abilities such as super strength, Gilgamesh's strength far exceeds that of his counterparts, making him one of the most physically powerful characters in all of Marvel, with strength comparable to that of Hercules, Thor, and other godlike beings. As a result of countless millennia of training, Gilgamesh is also an extremely skilled hand-to-hand -hand combat fighter, which, coupled with his imperviousness to damage, makes him one of Marvel's most dangerous characters. As is the case with most other Eternals, Gilgamesh can also emit deadly beams of light, heat, and physical force from his hands and eyes, and can manipulate matter to a limited degree. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with 1977's Eternals, number 13. Number 3, Squirrel Girl. Born to Dorian and Maureen Green, Dorian Green suffered a modification in her genes for unknown reasons that granted her squirrel-like abilities, which manifested predominantly in the form of a prehensile tail. When her parents consulted with the doctor, it was determined that Dorian wasn't actually a mutant, even though it was just kind of assumed that she was. At the age of 10, she discovered that she could communicate with squirrels, and that's how she met Monkey Joe, who encouraged her to use her powers and abilities for good. Her full arsenal of powers is kind of like Spider-Man's if you think about it, but with squirrel attributes as opposed to, you know, spidey powers. 
She has super strength, superhuman jaw strength, a regenerative healing factor, and of course her three foot prehensile tail that she can basically use as an extra limb. The best thing about Squirrel Girl though in my opinion and honestly everyone else's that I've talked to is that she is so immensely kind and friendly which somehow makes her more powerful. At one point Doreen hijacked an Iron Man suit to head outside the stratosphere and face off against Galactus and in true Squirrel Girl fashion she is able to instead convince Galactus into letting her find a tasty alternative to consuming the planet Earth like a Thin Mint. Getting him to admit that all the people in skyscrapers would just, I don't know, hurt his mouth. She befriended the planet Devourer and that is absolutely nuts. In addition to Galactus, she has also quote unquote defeated Kraven the Hunter and Doctor Doom, something that not every hero can say. Check out Doreen for yourself in her first appearance in 1991's Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2. Number 2, The Sentry. Robert Reynolds, aka Sentry, aka Marvel's dark answer to Superman. He's a superhero with a ton of powers, but he is constantly at war with the dark force within called the Void. So basically, when a middle-aged Bob remembers he was once the superhero of the century, he returns to his heroic life when he finds out the Void, his archenemy, is returning to Earth. However, most of Earth's population has no memory of him. It's later revealed that the Void is a second personality within him, and that both personas have been erased to protect himself and the world. His powers come from a special version of the Super Soldier formula called the Golden Century Serum, and has given him the power of immortality alongside superhuman levels of speed, strength, agility, and stamina, as well as teleportation, flight, and just so much more. Sentry has been seen easily lifting 100 tons with little to no effort, meaning that if he really, really pushes himself, his weight limit could be, I don't know, like 110 tons or even 150. Honestly, who knows, this is just speculation, but when you take into consideration all the additional powers that Sentry has, we think being in the top 5 of Marvel's strongest heroes is a fair ranking. Throughout the Marvel Universe, Sentry has been seen as a member of the New Avengers, the Mighty Avengers, the Dark Avengers, and even the Horsemen of Death, and every time he has been a vital member to the group. Check them out for yourself, starting with 2000 Century, number one. And number one, Franklin Richards. Sure, his parents are strong, you know, Sue and Reed Richards, very strong, I think we all know that, but who knew that combining their mutagenic genes would create the most powerful being in the cosmos? Franklin Richards is a mutant who is classified as a rare and omega level character. His most powerful characteristic is that he can literally warp reality as well as control the fundamental forces of the universe. He is one of the strongest mutants to ever exist, with powers equal to that of Celestials, meaning he is on par with literal gods. Unlike most other mutants, his powers actually manifested before puberty, and needless to say, wielding such a power at an early age gave cause for concern from his family. But Franklin has proven more than capable of using his power since, and even made the devourer of worlds Galactus his hero. Honestly, feats of strength don't get any more bold than that, and given how Franklin still has plenty of room left to grow, it stands to reason that he could become not just the universe's most powerful hero, but its most powerful inhabitant as well. There's also an alternate universe where Franklin obtains immortality alongside all his original powers, which is just insane. It's just insane if you think about it. Check out his story for yourself in his first appearance in 1968's Fantastic Four Annual, number 6. Number 10, Dazzler. Starting off our list today, we have Alison Blair, a mutant who dreamed of becoming a singer one day, but unfortunately, her dad wasn't too on board with that. She manifested her powers one day while performing at a junior high dance, blinding everyone in sight minus herself. If you're not familiar with this character, then you're probably a little confused, so let me explain. Allison possesses some pretty cool abilities known as sound conversion and light projection. Sound conversion allows her to absorb the sounds around her and either release them back out in a big energy blast, or use them for a makeshift echolocation that has proved to be pretty effective if I do say so myself. And then light projection allows her to control the energy levels of the outer electron shells of her body in such a way that causes the release of photons. And by doing this, she can blind her opponents, shoot lasers, photon blasts, create holograms, and so much more. Now aside from these two powers, she also seems to be basically immortal because she has this mysterious resurrection factor that prevents her from dying by any normal means. Check out her story for yourself starting with her first appearance in 1980's X-Men number 130. Number 9, Starbrand. The Starbrand may be an object, but were you aware that there is also a hero that goes by that name as well? On Earth, 148,611, Ken Connell received the Starbrand from a mysterious old man he met in the woods. With the Starbrand equipped, he gained pretty much limitless powers including super strength, flight, near invulnerability, and a couple more. Ken strived to use his powers for good, but often was thwarted by his own shortcomings and the harsh realities of the real world. But that didn't stop him, and eventually he decided to become a much more traditional superhero by donning the spandex suit and mask. Despite his intelligence, Ken was never really able to harness the full power of the star brand because he lacked the imagination and curiosity needed. However, that didn't stop him from causing some serious damage. Literally. 
After learning the supposed origins of the Star Brand, he killed hundreds of people at a comic book convention and unintentionally destroyed all of Pittsburgh, leading him to believe that he might be better off without his powers, and I think we all kind of agree. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1986's Star Brand, number one. Number eight, Namor. The first Marvel character to have a history that spawns over 70 years of publication, Namor Mackenzie, aka the Submariner, is certainly a strong and resourceful character in the Marvel Universe. Thanks to his unique genetic makeup being a human slash Atlantean slash mutant hybrid, he possesses a pretty crazy arsenal of powers, including super strength, speed, stamina, and durability, flight, healing, and hydrokinesis. Namor is stronger and tougher than most any human or Atlantean. He can go toe to toe with some of the strongest beings on Earth and come out unscathed, especially when underwater or covered in water, which increases his strength by extreme degrees. Namor has telepathic abilities from his Atlantean heritage that allows him to communicate and command not only sea life, but also fellow Atlantean soldiers, if need be. Namor also has a much longer lifespan than a human and shows very little signs of aging despite being born many many decades ago. We've seen Namor as a member of the X-Men Red Team, the Defenders of the Deep, the Invaders, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and that's not even half of the team that he's been on. Like I said, he has been around for a very long time. Now if you're not familiar with this character, then you are truly missing out, so check him out in his first appearance in 1939's Motion Picture Funnies Weekly, number one. Number seven, Spectro. Monica Rambeau gained her powers one day while working for the New Orleans Harbor Police when she was exposed to and bombarded by extra-dimensional energy. Now classified as an alpha level threat, she uses her newfound energy form to create energy blasts, alter her appearance, fly, and just a whole lot more. Given the name Captain Marvel by the media, she became friends with many super-powered folks early on and actually served as an Avenger for a period of time. Becoming its leader at one point, however, she was forced to step down from the group after many many injuries. Out of respect for Genus Vell, the son of the original Captain Marvel, she changed her name to Photon so that he could take up the mantle and carry out his father's legacy. <laughs> Fast forward a little bit past her time with the Mighty Avengers, we see Monica, now known as Spectrum, join the newly formed Ultimates. However, after the second superhuman civil war, the team was disbanded by the government because of the way they dealt with conflict. They did later reassemble to investigate Eternity at the request of Galactus, and eventually the team was combined into Alpha Flight, and they were working to keep people safe to this day. If you want to know more about Monica's origin story, check her out in her first appearance in 1982's Amazing Spider-Man Annual, number 16. Number 6, Legion. David Haller, son of Charles Xavier, who Charles actually didn't know about until he founded the New Mutants. Born a mutant, David developed his powers after his home was invaded and his stepfather was killed right in front of him. He woke the latent psionic powers within himself and incinerated the brains of the assassins. However, there was a major drawback to this power. David formed a telepathic bond with his victims, experiencing their emotions and thoughts as they died. And this traumatized him and still seems to affect him to this day. Interestingly enough, David is capable of creating new mutations and powers all the time. And in order to cope with that immense power, he creates new personalities slash personas to govern them. Some of the most well-known being personality number five, the Legion. Personality 3, Jack Wayne, Personality 4, Cindy, and of course, Personality 2, Jamel Karami, who attempted to restructure David's psyche into his own image. Now you're probably thinking he's a little low on this list considering he has at least 200 plus powers at his disposal, and you would be absolutely right, but he is slightly below average in just about everything else, and also the fact that his disassociated personality disorder hindered him greatly. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1985's New Mutants number 26, and let me know if you agree with the placement on this list today in the comments below. Number 5. Clayton Cortez was a Marine who was sold off to Dr. Alva, the head of the Weapon X Batch 8 division, focused on creating some Hulk Wolverine hybrids. Alva left more of Cortez's brain in with the intention to better train him and discipline him, and from there Weapon H was born. As a newly created mutant slash gamma mutate cyborg, he has the DNA of Wolverine, the Hulk, and a multitude of other superpower beings grafted to him. Not to mention his bones have been bonded with adamantium. He possesses the ability to change back and forth between his human and Hulk form, and he has retractable bone claws, projectile claws, and even extendable bone claws as well. Basically, Cortez is an advanced Wolverine with the powers of the Hulk. We've seen him easily take down the Hulk, the Euro Wendigo, and a few more of our other favorite heroes and villains. According to Dr. Alba herself, it is said that Weapon H could easily kill every living being on Earth, and seriously, I believe her. Check him out for yourself, starting with 2017's Totally Awesome Hulk, number 21. Number 4, Sync. Everett Thomas was a mutant from Missouri, possessing an ability known as synchronicity. This ability allows him to quote unquote be in sync with the other superhumans in his immediate vicinity, and thanks to this he is able to gain and use whatever powers they have. 
This is all done through the aura that he emits as it is what absorbs the energy around him. After the phalanx crisis, Everett and the other youths were all relocated to the Massachusetts Academy, where they were trained to use their powers, received a formal education, and acted as the new generation of X-Men known as Generation X. He was briefly turned into a parasitic mutant by the team's arch nemesis Emplet, who wanted to destroy Sink's happy family life. Under Emplet's influence, Sink menaced his family and friends until M, who he had difficulty syncing with, was able to defeat him. Skip ahead a bit and we see Sink find a bomb and there were human students nearby. Everett synced with the nearest mutant, Monet. However, Monet was too far away so he only received a portion of her powers, which, which happened to be her super strength. Using all of his might, he threw the human kids out the window, saving them from the explosion, but sadly, he was not able to save himself, dying to save his human peers. He does come back though, so don't worry. Check them out for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1994's X-Men Volume 2, number 36. Number 3, Rogue. Easily one of the most well-known X-Men out there, Rogue is a mutant that was born with an incredible ability, albeit a harmful and involuntary one. She has the ability to absorb the powers, energy, memories, knowledge, talents, personality, and physical abilities of another human being, be them mutant or not, through physical skin-to-skin -skin contact. This transfer is usually temporary, lasting for a period of time relative to how long contact was maintained, but the transfer may become permanent in certain cases, like how it seems she still has the powers of Wonder Man, or how she permanently absorbed Miss Marvel and Sunfire's powers. You probably already know, but this power was pretty tough to control at first, and that deterred her away from any sort of romantic and physical touch. But eventually she learned to fully control her powers and married Gambit. Funnily enough, despite being known as a member of the X-Men, she was initially raised as a villain by Mystique and the Brotherhood of Evil, but she eventually reformed and turned to the X-Men. Throughout her publication, she has taken on the likes of the Dazzler, Miss Marvel, Captain America, Thor, Nimrod, and Emplet, and the fact that she's still around to tell the tale just speaks volumes about her power. Check her out, starting with her first appearance in 1981's Avengers Annual, number 10. Number 2, Jack of Hearts. Real name Jonathan Hart, aka Jack Hart, the Jack of Hearts is the son of the scientist Philip Hart and an alien from the Contraxian race. However, he was unaware that his mother was an alien for most of his life. When Hart was a teenager, his father was murdered right in front of him, and in an attempt to hide from the killers, he was covered in a powerful chemical known as the Zero Fluid, and this mutated his body and gave him the powers he has today. From that point on, he was able to create powerful beams of energy from his body, and by further harnessing and honing his skills, he is able to fly. Not to mention he also has super strength, stamina, and durability, and an accelerated healing factor. In an attempt to control his powers, Jack of Hearts built a containment suit that resembled the Jack of Hearts playing card. The lack of control became a very recurring theme with Jack of Hearts, including his stint in the Avengers where he had to spend 14 hours a day in a containment room to prevent self-destruction. When, when his powers became uncontrollable, he chose to finally leave Earth, exploding in space without harming any innocent bystanders. He does eventually return though in Avengers Disassembled and in the Marvel Zombie miniseries, so don't worry too much. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with 1976's Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, number 22. And number one, Blue Marvel. Adam Brashear, aka Blue Marvel, was known as a child prodigy from a very early age, and has PhDs in electrical engineering and theoretical physics. After serving his time in the Korean War, Adam joined and led a project attempting to harness antimatter by creating a negative reactor. But there was an unexpected explosion, and both he and Connor Sims were exposed to radiation. Sims wasn't too lucky and his whole body disassembled, but Adam was able to become a stable antimatter reactor and develop some pretty sweet powers. As Blue Marvel, he possesses super strength, can manipulate antimatter into energy blasts, can fly, is pretty much invulnerable, and is pretty much immortal as well, as he ages much slower than normal humans. As a part of the Mighty Avengers, both the 1970s version and the one led by Luke Cage, and the Ultimate, we've seen Blue Marvel go up against the likes of the Death Walkers, King Hyperion, and one time he even flew directly through Shumagorath's head. He has also been seen to withstand the blast of a hydrogen and nuclear bomb, and able to withstand blows from Captain Marvel. So, yeah. He deserves the top spot today. Check him out for yourself, starting with 2009's Adam, Legend of the Blue Marvel, number one. Coming in at number 10, we have Taskmaster. Let's kick off the list with a villain who is pretty well known and is actually going to be the main villain in the next upcoming Black Widow movie. At face value, sure, Taskmaster is pretty strong, but I wouldn't put him in the ranks of strongest of all time. After all, he can still be killed by conventional means, unlike Galactus or Thanos. But what makes Taskmaster so powerful is his ability to train others. On more than one occasion, Taskmaster has been in charge of training armies to fight against 
against heroes. Now, because Taskmaster has his super drug, which allows him to have insanely powerful recall, and he is able to mimic and decipher other people's combat styles, he could use this to prepare thousands of people to take down heroes in the perfect way. He would know exactly how to fight them, and he can display all of their techniques because he already knows them. So it's not so much that Taskmaster himself is massively powerful, but it's the way that he can apply his skills. Coming in at number nine, we have The Natural, a brand new villain on the scene, so the potential of their own power is still unknown, but it would seem at the very least they can beat the hell out of some of the most skilled heroes that are already calling themselves Avengers. In the first issue where we see The Natural take center stage, he comes into conflict with Bucky Barnes and the Falcon. The two of them are veterans of the hero world and should be able to take out a new villain with no problem. I mean, at first glance, The Natural looks like a 20 year old with the brightest blonde hair and eyes you have ever seen. He looks like he should be on a K-pop poster, not beating the hell out of two members of the Avengers. Well, that's exactly what he does. And before we can get any more details about who this brand new villain is, he has to run off and we have no idea where he went. I think it's safe to say that this guy could be one of the Avengers most skilled enemies in the future. Coming in at number eight, we have Stilt Man. I mean, the name alone is super lame. You couldn't call yourself anything cooler like Dr. Tall or Towerfoot or Lanky Larry, anything. But even though Stilt Man is super lame at first glance and doesn't have any real powers outside of his super suit, he is actually quite strong. When you go through the list of heroes that he has gone toe to toe with and actually created a lot of issues for, he actually starts to look like a little bit of a big shot. Mind you, he's not gonna be ripping down reality anytime soon, but he might just kick Wolverine in the head so hard he gets a concussion for like 30 seconds. Coming in at number seven, we have Bessie the Hell Cow. I mean, we have to throw Bessie on here just because your average comic fan would have never heard of her. It definitely caught me off guard. How do you make a cow that is so powerful it constantly comes back from the dead and has been a villainous threat for nearly 300 years? Well, you have Dracula bite the cow and drain the blood out of it. Then the cow dies. Then the cow comes back to life as a vampire cow and goes on the loose trying to murder anyone that gets in its way. And this cow has all the regular tropes that vampires have, so you better believe that she's going to be drinking blood all the time. Also, she has the ability to move her soul into another cow's body if she gets killed, so in a way she is immortal. And what if she can move her soul into another creature's body, like something even more powerful? Coming at number six, we have the Hulk. Wait, why is Hulk on this list? He's a hero, and we all know how strong he is. Well, I threw him on the list because even though his strength is known, his changes to the side of villainy are probably not as well renowned. There is an entire comic run, Planet Hulk, where the Hulk is banished from Earth and was supposed to live out his days on a desolate planet, but then he ends up becoming the king of a faraway world and then returns to Earth to lay waste to all the Avengers, and holy moly does he do a number on them. And there have been several times when the Hulk has turned his back on his pals because of one of his famous mood swings, or even became their enemy at a crucial moment where they needed him to be clear-headed. In the end, Hulk is only a hero for as long as his patience lasts, which is usually pretty long, but can shift at any moment. Bruce Banner. We might as well follow one half with the other. Now, even though Hulk is way stronger than Banner, Dr. Banner is way more unexpected of a villain. I mean, he's been a certified hero right up until Jason Aaron had his run with him on the Hulk. This was where the Hulk had Dr. Doom separate him from Banner for good. Now you think this would be better for the both of them, but turns out Banner goes insane without the Hulk floating around in his head, and Banner as a villain is pretty powerful. He starts a Dr. Moreau island making a bunch of Hulk animal hybrids, an army of Hulk creatures is enough to make any member of the Avengers sweat. And on top of all this, he's one of the smartest people on planet Earth. So even though it hasn't happened a lot, when Banner goes bad, everyone should be shook. Coming in at number four, we have Mojo. I don't know if Mojo is more unexpected or forgotten, but I think he slides perfectly into this spot on the list. Mojo is basically what happens when you give a CEO supreme cosmic power without any laws. Mojo is the ruler of his world and basically runs everything like a TV executive, creating more and more outlandish ways to create entertainment for his people without a shred of morality. But Mojo has been able to capture some of the strongest heroes and force them to compete in battles of strength so he can keep his ratings at an all time high. Coming at number three, we have Venom. Once again, another villain who packs a punch, but usually operates in the realm of manageability. Like if Venom is on the loose, you don't call in the Avengers A team. You send in the East Coast Avengers to deal with them and then you call it a day. But here's the thing, symbiotes can sometimes get stronger over time and their strength is very much attached to the person they bond to. For instance, there was one occasion where Venom combined with Red Hulk and Ghost Rider to make one of the most incredible comic book fantasies I could ever dream 
dream of. So for his day to day endeavors, Venom is a cool villain with an amazing backstory and a decent power level. But when you get into some of the all time most powerful things that he has ever done, he is pretty amazing. Coming into the number two spot, we have Juggernaut. The first YouTube video I ever watched was a dubbed episode of X Men, and I still remember it. It highlighted the Juggernaut in the best way. But even though we know the Juggernaut is strong as hell, he's not the strongest in the universe kind of strong. He's able to take on some of the stronger Marvel heroes like Thor, but he can also be bested by the likes of Spider Man. But here's the thing the Juggernaut's power level tends to fluctuate a lot. He gets his juice from the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, which is basically powered by a god from another dimension. On one occasion, Kane Marco, aka the Juggernaut, was able to tap into the full potential of this gem and became a being so powerful he could crack through realities with a punch. He was also 100 feet tall, so as you can imagine, he was quite the tough villain to take down. In fact, if he never lost touch with the true strength of that gem, he might have been supreme overlord of all the Marvel Universe. And coming into the number one spot, we have Absorbing Man. At face value, Absorbing Man is a brute who can suck in some metal and punch dudes in the face. It's a very simple skill. But here's the thing about Absorbing Man. His powers are actually magical. So that means he can absorb things that work outside of the realm of reality. He is able to absorb energy from magical weapons, and he's also been able to absorb Ultron. Wait. What? Yeah, you know that powerful robot that almost killed the Avengers like a hundred times and was actually successful on a few occasions in other timelines? Well, Absorbing Man sucked him in and then was able to absorb knowledge and basically became the most powerful creature on the planet by far. So who would have thought that some low tier criminal would be able to get to such a high power level? That is way over 9,000. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Multiple Man. James Madrox, he made his first comic book appearance in Giant Size Fantastic Four, issue four. And right off the bat, he seems very soft spoken. He seems very gentle. I mean, the thing is yelling at him and he's literally like, why do you reject me? Why? Like he's so almost poetic in a way. And then when the thing goes to clobber him, bam, there's multiple more men. Now he wasn't used very much in the X-Men, but he spent most of his days with X-Factor, but this guy is underrated. His powers may seem kind of weak compared to somebody like Jean Grey, but these duplicates can each make a duplicate. Let me try something. Look at me! I'm Mr. Me Seeks! I'm Mr. Me Seeks! Look at me! Hi! At one point, this guy had 40 of him running around town. 40! Now, the duplicates think, they feel, and they act independently, but they're guided by the original James Madrox. In a way, they're guided. They like kind of know what to do. Each of these duplicates manifests one aspect of James' personality, and the longer the time away, the more those traits become extreme. And if one of these duplicates passed away, he can sense that the general area where the body is, which is like the saddest radar ever. This guy could take over the world if he wanted. It would be like that scene from The Matrix, but with more monologues probably. And before we go on to this list of X-Men, you probably wouldn't expect to be that powerful. Guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, just right there, just give it a little tap tap, and it helps our studio out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get back to the list. Lickety split. Number nine, Darwin. We saw this next mutant for a hot minute in X-Men First Class. He was played by Eddie Gathegi, who unfortunately didn't survive too long. See, he threw his life down on the line in order to protect his fellow X-Men. And this was still in the early days too. What a champ. He first showed up in the comics in 2005 with X-Men Deadly Genesis issue two. Armando Munoz looked a lot different than we saw on screen as well. Since he was four years old, he was bald, his arms were super long, and his eyes were changing. He sure looks a little bit different than the young, handsome actor that we saw in the movie. His ability comes in handy a lot, actually, more so in the X-Men movies. See, in the comics, he's practically immortal. His ability once allowed him to survive Hela's death touch. I mean, it's a little bit different than the last time we saw him, that's for sure. Number eight, Caliban. An albino mutant and former member of the Morlocks, Caliban made his first comic book appearance in Uncanny X-Men 148. So he has the ability to track down any mutant. He actually sacrifices himself in the movie Logan, where Stephen Merchant played him. He was also in X-Men Apocalypse for a bit too, played by a different actor. He was played by Tomas Lamarcus. He was originally an ally to the X-Men, but once he became a tracker for Apocalypse in X-Factor issue 24, titled The Fall of the Mutants. So he's pretty powerful, and he's done a lot of cool stuff too. He may seem like a gentle, lanky, pale man, but when Caliban is stressed out in the comics, he gains two additional powers. 
super strength, and fear absorption. So if you put him in a corner, he'll be able to absorb the psionic energy in your fear and use it to power himself up even more. Number seven, Glob Herman, AKA Robert Herman, although Glob is much more fun to say. He made his debut at New X-Men issue 117, and he grew up with a father who despised mutants, so already he's off to a pretty rocky start. So when Glob mutated, his father was just not on board, so his mother drove Glob out to Westchester and just left him for Professor X. Like you leave a baby at a fire station. It's just like, yep, here you go, your problem now. This mutation was interesting. So his skin was this transparent living wax, which he's able to maintain being on fire, which is pretty amazing off the bat. You can light him on fire and he's good to go. That's amazing. He runs with the new mutants now, and although his name is Silly and he's literally a glob, he can also possess powers of super strength and super speed, despite how he may look. So he can get hit by these massive bombs like it's nothing, then he can fight whoever launched that bomb with ease. The X-Men literally once used him as a heat shield once, they strapped glob to the front of their ship and it didn't seem pleasant for a man glob but he was good he didn't die or anything he was just he had to rest for a bit number six toad when you think of the name toad in relation to a superhero you're going to picture something pretty silly in your head and mortimer toneby isn't that far off from what you think he made his first appearance in uncanny x-men issue four so he hops around which seems silly but his legs are so strong that he can leg press three tons. And it's not just his legs that are strong, his upper half possesses superhuman strength as well. His arms can lift about one ton. He also has flexible bone structure, regenerative healing factor, infrared vision, and the best part, his 30 foot long tongue can also act as a whip. And it can secrete venom that can give him mind control over your body. And his saliva is acid as well. Number five, Wither. Making his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 3, Kevin Ford grew up thinking that he was cursed, or he was the most unlucky person ever, one or the two. See, his mutant power started manifesting, and then he noticed it first in his plants, and then he noticed it in his clothes, and then he noticed it in people. So what would happen is his plants would wither. They would wither and they would die. And then his clothes were starting to decay as well. So once his father figures out this mutation, he tries to calm him down, but coming into contact with him, obviously the inevitable happens. He sees the world in this lifeless or decaying way now. See, it's part of this mutation. He can disintegrate all forms of organic matter just by one touch. Whatever he touches withers, so now we get his name. It turns into dust within seconds, whatever it is. Now this seems boring, I guess. When you think of it in like a cinematic battle, it's not too exciting, but this guy can take out an entire elite squad just by touching them. I mean, realistically, just send him in always. No one's gonna expect it. All you have to do is get him to fist bump everybody and then bam, just like that. Nocturne. This next one, she comes from Earth 2182, where she's the daughter of Nightcrawler and Scarlet Witch. Now, she's got her dad's looks, unfortunately. She's blue, furry, she's got three fingers and three toes. She's got a tail and yellow eyes and pointed ears. Now, sure, she looks like she can take out any bad guy, like she looks like an alien. So she possesses the powers of both of her parents. She can blast off energy bolts, she can climb walls, but what makes her even more powerful is that she has the ability to possess others for 12 hours or one lunar cycle. But once that timer is up, the victim is just completely out of it for 24 hours, just comatose. This super offspring packs a super punch, that's for sure. Number three, Tattoo. Christine Cord made her comic book debut in the new X-Men issue 126. She was a student of the Xavier Institute and she's known as Tattoo, well, because her mutation allows her to display messages or designs on her skin and she can phase through matter, which is also kind of fun. She's pretty awesome. I mean, when you first think of her, you may just think of the skin messages and be like, oh, whatever, maybe she's a spy. Maybe she can be like, send help and then use her skin. Cool, that's good. But check this out. Tattoo actually phased her hand into Cyclops' head once and told him that if she becomes solid, he would not survive to see the end of it. How awesome is that? But she sadly lost her powers during the events of M-Day, but if you ever ran into Christine again, she would probably surprise you with her new ability. When she was released from jail, she joined the New Warriors and was given her own stilt man armor, becoming Longstrike. So bam, two and one, talk about underrated. Number two, Banshee. The Screaming Banshee, okay. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 28. Sean Cassidy was born as the heir to the castle and estate of Cassidy Keep, Ireland. Now, Professor Xavier asked him to join the X-Men at the same time as Thunderbird, and they both stayed as members of the new X-Men. Now, he went on to train the new generation of X-Men and Generation X, but he sadly lost his life during Deadly Genesis when he was trying to stop Blackbird from crashing when it was taken over. So when you think of an X-Men who screams so loud he can hurt people, 
example, eh, it's impressive on its own, sure, but his screams are actually stronger than we really think. His screams can actually break through an inch of steel. And with these wings that Professor X developed for him, he's able to harness this power and use his screams as energy to help him fly. So he can do so much more with his voice as well. He can tighten the sound waves around himself to make a sonic shield, and he can influence your subconscious by changing the tones and vibrations of his voice. He can literally change your mind. How awesome is that? What do you mean you want a divorce? Uh... And finally, number one, we have my favorite on the list, Bailey Hoskins. Okay, I have to talk about this poor kid, okay. Strongest X-Men you wouldn't expect? Yeah, that is for sure Bailey Hoskins. The only appearance of this kid is in the 2016 miniseries, X-Men, Worst X-Man Ever, which is a pretty cruel name. He was a student at Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, and his power is pretty spectacular. He can self-detonate, he can make himself explode, and you would never expect it just by looking at him. I mean, come on. Kicking off the list at number 10, M. Monet St. Croix made her first appearance in Generation X issue 1 as Penance, and by the time issue 40 rolled around, she was introduced as Monet. She was the second child of Ambassador Cartier St. Croix, who was a wealthy former president of numerous corporations. Now, although she had an older brother and two young twin sisters, her father still favored her. Now, her brother Marius had mutant abilities, and when they manifested, he became evil. Sadly, he actually took out his mother and was kicked out of the family, and then he asked Monet to join him, traveling through other dimensions, gaining power. She was like, nope. I'm good, thanks. So she rejected him, and Marius trapped her in this form of a mute creature with diamond-hard red skin. And he fed on her powers. What a not nice guy. It's awful. So Claudia and Nicole, her sisters, the twins, they joined forces. Like, literally. They merged into a new version of Monet. And it was all pretty much the same. Personality, appearance, and powers. M is a telepathic genius, and of course, super strength and super speed sure does help her get the job done. Before we continue on with this list, guys, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It does help our channel quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go right back into this list. I don't want to waste any more time. Number nine, Frenzy. Okay, Joanna Cargill. She made her first debut in X Factor issue four. Now, she accidentally punched her father so hard that her hand went through his chestal plate which is just a great way to find out you have powers. Now, her father was in no means a good person at all, but still, finding out you're a mutant in that way is pretty rough. That's pretty traumatizing for a young kid. So she became known as Frenzy and she joined the Allegiance of Evil. Now, after the Acolytes disbanded, Joanna became ambassador for Genosha and stood by Magneto until she was captured by the US government in order to learn more about Magneto, but she didn't talk. She was a tough one. She didn't talk until Jean Grey entered and freed her, giving her the option to join the X-Men the easy way or the hard way. Jean used the hard way and then Frenzy's entire attitude was changed. Her personality was like campy, it was awkward, not nearly as confident as before, but her powers were still there. She did help the X-Men find Magneto's base. She was a team member, even if it was forced and campy. So after Magneto's defeat, her mind control was released and she rejoined the Acolytes and then left the X-Mansion. Super speed, super strength, super stamina, super everything, you name it, she's got it. Her body has been described as being hard as steel, making the She-Hulk put up quite a fight. Number eight, armor. Hisako Ichiki made her first appearance in Astonishing X-Men Volume 3, Issue 4. Now, she grew up in Japan before joining the Xavier Institute. She formed a close relationship with Wing and Blindfold once she joined Katie Pride's Paladin Squad. Now, her new close friends were being attacked one day by Ord of Breakworld, so Armor used her unique mutant abilities to take care of him with a mighty punch. She can create the psionic exoskeleton suit of armor, hence the name armor. It's fueled by the energy of Hisako's ancestors. In the Ultimate Universe, her abilities create quite the spectacle as well. They appear in the shape of these massive animals, these great beasts, even dragons at some point. As if these abilities weren't surprising and fantastic enough, she also received combat training from Wolverine and tactic training from Cyclops. So she's kind of a big deal. Number seven, Vulcan. He named himself after the Roman god of fire, but Vulcan's real identity was that of Gabriel Summers. He was born after Cyclops and Havoc, well, not really. He wasn't really born. He was actually surgically removed from his mother's body and placed in an incubator accelerator, then aged to be at his prime, and then sent to Earth to work for Dak and Shikari. One of those normal childhoods, you know? So he escaped and he was found by Mora McTaggart with no memories of who he is or where he came from. Poor kid. So we asked for Charles' help and then all Kid Vulcan wanted to do was learn about his mutant abilities. Sounds like the perfect student. Like, come on, you're doing all the right things. Charles needed help from him and other newcomers to find the remaining X-Men. So Charles put him in this danger room as a training exercise to get them sharp in a short amount of real time. So it felt like months of training, but in fact, it's only a few hours. And then Vulcan and this new team were sent to Krakoa to rescue the original X-Men. But Vulcan revealed to Scott that Xavier sacrificed his own brother 
to save him. Number six, Maggot. That's a fun name right off the bat. Maggot? Maggot, or I mean, Japeth, first appeared in Uncanny X-Men issue 345. He was born with five siblings, but never grew at the same rate as them. And on top of that, he had struggled with pains in his stomach. Sadly, those pains turned out to maybe be cancer, and he feared that he would run his family dry with medical bills. So at just age 12, he left the South African village and started to think of a dark solution to his problem. Super tragic. So he ended up in the Kalahari Desert and was found by Magneto, who figured out that these stomach issues were actually these two slug-like creatures that lived in the boy's body, and they acted as his digestive system. Years later, Maggot reached out to Magneto in hopes that he would help him with this gross situation. Now the slugs, named Eenie and Meenie, because that's what you do when you have slugs, you give them cute nicknames, they were these sentient techno-organic slugs that could devour anything. Doesn't matter what kind of matter you are, gone, devoured. They would do it fast too, not at the pace of normal slugs. And once lunchtime was finished, they would return back to Japeth's stomach, transferring the energy from what they just consumed, granting him super strength and durability. Also, we had a nice avatar tan to go along with these magnificent abilities. Number five, Kid Omega. Now again, the word kid is used lightly in this list. You do not want to underestimate Quentin Quire, aka Kid Omega. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 134. He's been described as one of the most powerful telepaths next to Jean Grey. So off the bat, you know you're in for a treat. He was one of Xavier's prized pupils. That is until, of course, he put together the Omega Gang, which was this gang that would handle humans after they've committed crimes against mutants. They would do it themselves, not in the poetic way, to say the least. They were like the super kid police. They even went to a tattoo shop and made it official. They got these Omega symbols tattooed over top of the X. Now his abilities are insane. He can manipulate your perception, judgment, wills, and common sense. He's able to track you down by listening to your thoughts, folks. Your thoughts, you can hear your thoughts. And even in this instance, if you were a telepath, you wouldn't see him coming because he would block out your powers to sneak up on you. One of the coolest things about Quentin is the psionic shotgun that he can create. It just looks cool. He just channels all this mental energy as this astral energy shotgun. And if that doesn't do the trick, yeah, the psionic rocket launcher should. Number four, Kubark, AKA Kid Gladiator, another kid. Kubark is the son of Emperor Gladiator. He was this young prince sent to earth to train and discover more secrets about his powers. And the one place you go and do that is of course the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Warbird was his bodyguard. And the reason that he was sent to earth, this new kid on the block, was because he destroyed more than half of the Shi'ar royal city on Chandelar just for fun, you know? In Wolverine and the X-Men, he arrives and starts giving orders to other students, like to bring him snacks, the whole thing. And he wanted these students to call him their new Imperial Overlord. He's jam-packed with superpowers though. He can possess the ability to fly and his eyes are pretty interesting, not just to look at. He has microscopic vision and can blast heat beams through those peepers. And with an incredible lung capacity, he can take in large amounts of air and blast it out, creating these hurricane-like winds. And if that doesn't work, he can use his breath to freeze you dead in your tracks. Number three, Lifeguard, AKA Heather Cameron. Lifeguard is such a cool character. Okay, let's talk about her. She's super unique. She made her first debut in Extreme X-Men issue six. And judging by her name, yes, she of course started off as a lifeguard and also as a surfer. Her mutant ability is that of a lifeguard, literally. Her powers allow her to manifest whatever is needed to save the life of somebody near her. If you're allergic to peanuts, bam, EpiPen, stab, we're good. She's like the super medic of the X-Men, she's awesome. After the events of M-Day, Heather was one of the lucky to retain her abilities. She's almost a combination of Darwin and Mystique. Now I talked about Darwin in part one of this list, so if you want a little bit of catching up to do, you know where to find that. Number two, Zeitgeist. Axel Clooney, he was seen in Deadpool 2 and he made his first comic book appearance in X-Force issue 116. His ability, mm, let's just talk about it. He can spit acid, like a lot of acid, so much acid. It can eat through any substance. And I think what makes this character even more wild is when he himself discovered these powers for the first time. Oh boy, okay. He was at the beach hanging out. He met this lovely woman. They clicked, it was romantic. They were nice, they were kissing on the beach. And then all of a sudden, this uh, this happens. A lot of acid puke, a lot of puke, real nasty stuff. Ugh. But this guy is super powerful. Like he can take on so many mutants. I mean, it's gross, but if only he didn't spew it out of his mouth, maybe he had fingers that could do the acid shooting, he'd be less of a gag, pun intended. And finally coming in at number one, 
Jubilee. Making her first appearance in Uncanny X-Men issue 244, Jubilee, aka Jubilation Lee, first discovered her mutant power of generating these dazzling sparkles from her hands. She was always seen as this little sister type character from the start, but she packs a powerful pretty punch. She was discovered by Dazzler, Cycloc, Rogue, and Storm during a rescue at the mall, and when she followed the women back through a portal, she ended up at the X-Men's temporary base in the Australian Outback. Jubilee and Wolverine ended up becoming a good pair, working missions together, and they were a fun duo. Now her powers grew to a whole new level, when a vampire ended up infecting the area of Union Square. This happens in Curse of the Mutants, and Jubilee being caught in the path of this infection ended up becoming a vampire. It's, it's a pretty big deal. Even before the vampire stuff, this is a highly underrated character. Kicking off the list at number 10, Wasp. Sometimes size matters. I mean, the Incredible Hulk can eat a car and then squish another car and toss it across San Francisco. That's awesome. But sometimes size doesn't necessarily matter. Janet Van Dyne may be small, but just like Ant-Man, she packs a mean punch. She made her first debut back in Tales to Astonish issue 44. And in the early 60s, she became a founding member of the Avengers. After her soon to be husband, Hank Pym, genetically altered her and gave her the ability to shrink down using Pym particles. She was also given biosynthetic wings implanted in her back to help her fly around while she fires bioelectric energy stings at bad guys. Donning the nickname The Wasp, she became Ant-Man's partner, and fans are excited that the release date being announced last week, we now get Ant-Man's third movie, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and it hits theaters February 2022. So in the MCU, Janet is finally an Avenger post-Endgame, and in Avengers issue one, well, she was already on the roster. Number nine, Black Knight. Dane Whitman made his comic book debut in Avengers issue 48. He inherited his uncle Garrett's castle and had no idea that his uncle was the villain the Black Knight. He found the Ebony Blade and passed its test, becoming the new Black Knight. He then decided to join the Masters of Evil like his uncle did, but he was going in undercover. He was on the good side, so he wanted to help the Avengers, but they still needed more. They didn't trust him quite enough yet. In Avengers issue 71, funny enough titled Endgame, Dane joins the Avengers. Well, kind of. Like I said, they didn't trust him so much until he helped fight Kang the Conqueror. And then they were like, okay, he's cool, come on aboard. He's an excellent swordsmith, so much so that he's beaten the swordsmith in combat. And that sword that he uses as well grants him immunity to magical powers. Plus the dude rides a winged horse, an underrated Avenger for sure. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up down below, that would be super helpful. It helps us a lot, especially while we're working from home. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now let's bounce right back into this list. Number eight, Avenger X. Cressida made her debut in Avengers Volume 7, Issue 2. When the Avengers got help from the X-Men to track down the Stranger, Professor X helped by using Cerebro to direct them to Northern Thailand, where they rescued a local woman named Cressida from the Cosmic Being. Now, she had this ability that could amplify the Avengers. They all got super jacked up, and even Cap said that he felt stronger. He felt like he could take on a full army. He's jumping higher, throwing 10 times harder. It's wild. When Scarlet Witch asked how she did that, she says she doesn't really know, but she feels sorry doing it. But the downside of her powers were kept hush-hush from Wanda. See, in order to empower them, she had to drain the life of everybody else in the village. And in the next issue, she was deemed an Avenger. She was given the tour, the whole thing, welcome aboard. But meanwhile, while this is going on, at Sunshine Nursing Home, the same thing was happening to those who got the life drained from the village. Powerful team member, but maybe a little bit too dark. Number seven, Squirrel Girl. On to something a little bit more bright, let's go on to Doreen Green. She made her comic book debut in Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2, Issue 8, back in the early 90s. She was born with these fantastic squirrel-like abilities, tail included. She learned she could communicate with squirrels at just age 10. Now this sounds like a fairy tale so far, but don't let the tail fool you. She packs an incredible punch. For example, in an early comic, she took on Dr. Doom. In Marvel Super Heroes issue 8, she bumps into Stark, gives him a run for his money in order to prove how powerful she is, and then she shows Tony her power. She jumps, she hops, she climbs all around. It's pretty impressive. Squirrels start coming in from everywhere, and then all of a sudden they're commanded to jump onto Tony. And then Doctor Doom came and interrupted the whole thing. He jammed Stark's electronics, and in order to save Tony, she sent that horde of squirrels onto the Doom ship. It was amazing. And then voila, Stark is free thanks to the insane squirrel posse. Then the squirrels get down to Doom, and then he leaves. He Pops out. He's like, I don't want anything to do with this. This is way too much for me. Guy straight up ran away. Doreen later joined the US Avengers on their 2017 run. Number six, Sandman. Believe it or not, Sandman was once an Avenger. William Baker made his comic book debut in 1963 with The Amazing Spider-Man issue four. And yeah, sure, most of the time, the Sandman is considered a villain, but that's why we have to mention this small change of heart because even bad guys, it's possible to change. It happens. He bumped into the thing, a similar looking 
American guy, you know, being big and beige, beige and big and all. So they had a little chat about life and how to use your abilities maybe for the greater good. So we started to help Spider-Man a bit here and there. And then in Avengers issue 329, Captain America announced a new Avengers team. And on that roster was Sandman. He was one of the seven reserve members. He of course didn't last long because, well, he was a reserve member for one. And coming from the villain side already, I'm sure he wasn't too committed. How great would that have been if the good guys had a sand dude? Wouldn't that be great? We could use the sand guy. Number five, triathlon slash 3D man. Okay, 3D man slash triathlon, AKA Delroy Garrett Jr. He joined the team in Avengers volume three, issue 27. He showed up and just whooped everybody's ass. It was great. The team basically had to hire him on the spot. They had no choice. But before this, he grew up running, hence his name triathlon. He competed in the Olympic games and he was crushing it. That was until he tested positive for steroids. And then he got his three medals taken away from him. So he turned to religion, to the triune understanding, and the group's founder, Jonathan Tremont, had found a fragment of a mysterious object and used it to give Garrett the powers of 3D man, the 3D man himself, look out. I would see a 3D man movie in 3D. God, what a ride that would be. You just don't put on the glasses and you don't see half the movie. You're like, oh, I get it. This is Cool, it's cool. Number four, US agent. Okay, spoilers coming in hot for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. If you haven't watched it yet, pause this video, watch the entire series, and then come back and click play. It's easy. John Walker is known for being the hothead that replaces Captain America in the show and in the comics. He went as far as injecting super soldier serum into his own body, but he didn't become Steve Rogers. Instead, he killed a guy with the Captain America shield. It's kind of brutal. And by the time the show ends, the shield is back in the hands of Captain America, Sam Wilson, and Walker becomes US agent, officially. The suit's black, so it's, you know, official and all. And in the comics, he eventually joined the ranks of the West Coast Avengers. And it feels like this is where the Avengers are going in the MCU currently. Because in the comics, when Hawkeye moved to the West Coast and set up an Avengers team there, the government wanted to put somebody official kind of out of the superhero loop in there just to make sure things are going smoothly. Now at this time, the Vision was also a bit of a problem, so that move made sense. So they sent in US Agent. Now with Vision being white in the MCU, I feel like they're kind of heading there. This is, this is getting good. It's getting tricky. Number three, Hawkeye. I have to mention Hawkeye because he's one of the 1960s Avenger recruits and he's one of the big six in the MCU. And I feel like he doesn't get enough credit on screen still. Like in the comics, he becomes Goliath, it's epic. When the West Coast Avengers were assembled, Hawkeye was the leader of the team, like I said. But for a little bit, that was until they thought the US agent would be a better replacement for leadership. So he ended up coming in and then taking over as the new leader. So things get a little wonky. So Hawkeye thought, eh, no sweat. I'll get some pin particles and we'll see who the biggest guy is after all. And then he became this. Number two, the Sentry. He made his first appearance in Sentry issue one. Meet Robert Reynolds. He was a struggling addict who made his way into a laboratory and discovered something called the Golden Sentry Serum. So he consumed it and then he got the surprise of a lifetime when he was given the power of a million exploding suns. So back in 1947, Project Sentry was put together by the remnants of the US Operation Rebirth and Canada's Department K. They joined forces and they wanted to recreate the Super Soldier Serum, but they magnified its effects 100,000 times. That plus a cool outfit in the mix and now we have a new superhero. So after this, Robert Robert fought alongside the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, and of course, the new Avengers. He's a really powerful guy. He once became a horseman of Apocalypse. He was the horseman death. And then he ended up going crazy because he thought he was the heir of Apocalypse. It was a whole thing, it was crazy. And finally, number one, Hercules. Of course, we can't forget the son of Zeus. Come on, the king of the Olympian gods, another 60s recruit. Hercules. He made his first Silver Age appearance in Journey into Mystery Annual Issue 1 in 1965, and in Avengers Issue 45, he and the rest of the team went against the Super Adaptoid. And right after the dust had settled, Hercules was standing with the team, expressing how bright the sun doth shines. Somebody even put his name on a sign. That's how you know it's official. As soon as a 19-year-old starts painting your name on it like a Katy Perry concert, bam. You made it. So with Russell Crowe reportedly cast as Zeus in the next Thor installment, we may be closer to Hercules than we think. Number 10, Mantis. A new addition to the Guardians team, Mantis went from being Ego's roommate in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 to becoming an Avenger, even holding Thanos down while the rest of the team tried to take the gauntlet off. Now in the comics, Mantis had to endure quite a bit before becoming an Avenger. She made her first appearance in Avengers issue 112, The Lion God Lives. Mantis was trained as a child by alien priests, section of the Kree, who thought that she was destined to be the celestial Madonna. She was killing it in martial arts, hence the nickname Mantis. Now her real name is Brant, but Mantis sounds much 
much more fun. No offense to all the brands out there. Those priests enhanced her mind, giving her telepathic abilities, and on her 18th birthday, she was given the gift of a lifetime when her mind was wiped and she was instead given false memories of her childhood as an orphan in Vietnam to experience a normal life. Because that's part of the celestial Madonna route. Nothing builds that Madonna power more than some time in Vietnam, right? And in doing so, Mantis learned to hold it down on her own quite easily. Number nine, Dr. Druid. Anthony Ludgate entered Marvel Comics in Weird Wonder Tales issue 19. He's a bit of a smarty pants, some would say. I mean, he got a degree in psychology from Harvard and then became a psychiatrist. But that wasn't enough for Anthony. He wanted to study the ancient powers of his ancestral druids. So he was studying the occult on his off time. He finally met the ancient one who passed down a lot of tricks and Anthony left and became Dr. Druid, assisting monster hunters, including Makari when they went against deviants. So this guy goes back quite far. He's also a little more dramatic than strange, some would say. In Avengers issue 294, he manipulated Captain America's mind so that he would be the replacement chairman. And this was right after Captain Marvel was injured. What a snake. And before we continue on with this list of strongest Avengers, you wouldn't expect part two. If you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be so helpful for our channel. It really helps us out a lot, especially while we're working from home. And if you haven't as well, hit that subscribe button maybe if you feel like it. I don't know, if you feel like it. Let's get back into this list. Number eight, Firestar. Angelica Jones made her comic book debut in Uncanny X-Men 193. She was born with, well, as you would guess by her name, the ability to generate great heat. Cerebro found her, but the Hellfire Club got to her moments before. She was learning a lot under the White Queen's guidance, honestly, unaware of the cruel nature of the club, of course. See, Frost actually gave her the nickname Firestar. So then Firestar joined as a reserve member in Avengers Volume 3, Issue 4. Yeah, so Hawkeye demanded that one of the two new members that they're recruiting has to be Firestar. He announced it to the world prematurely. He was that confident. The other members are like, whoa, whoa, let's hold on a second here because that spot that we had open was actually for you, Hawkeye. So, but they settled on reserve member. That's fine, that's good enough. Now cut to issue seven, the former X-Men member became a full Avengers member. Firestar was also amongst the lucky 198 mutants to have kept their abilities after the Scarlet Witch decimated the mutant population. Number seven, Wizard. This dude was only an Avenger for four years in the comics, but he's funky enough to mention. I feel like we don't talk about Wizard enough. Robert Frank Sr. made his first appearance in USA Comics 1, and after a run-in with a Cobra, he was bitten and his father had to use mongoose blood to try and save him the old fashioned way, where he sucks the poison out. Some wives tale and it surely worked, but his father had a heart attack during this do-it-yourself transfusion and bit the bullet. Robert, on the other hand, was blessed with super speed after this. And then he became the wizard. Great name, great name. He joined the Avengers in issue 173 back in 1978, but he met his fate and vision in the Scarlet Witch issue two in 1982. Number six, Demolition Man. Dennis Murphy, born in Detroit, Michigan. He looked up to superheroes quite a bit, as do most of us. He was actually great at football, but he wasn't great enough to be recruited professionally. Sad times. But then that's when the power broker comes in to strike up a bargain. Super strength ought to help you with those home games, right, Dennis? Let's do it. Well, what happened was he got so strong that if he did decide to play football with these humans, he would probably break through them. His name is Demolition Man. Nobody would expect this guy to be an Avenger because he wasn't even the best football player. That's like what Peter Parker says. He's like, I couldn't do stuff then, so I can't do stuff now. You know, he joined the Avengers in Captain America issue 349. He helped Battlestar and US agent free Captain America. And when US agent and Flag Smasher started to get a little distracted, D-Man himself finished the mission properly. Number five, lightning. Living lightning, here we go. It's hard to imagine that a man made of lightning would ever not get the spotlight, but that's what happens when you share the pages with this team. Lightning, AKA Miguel Santos, first came into comics as a villain, actually. But he joined the West Coast Avengers in issue 74. Now his father, cut to way before, his father was part of this group called the Legion of Living Lightning, or LOL, as some would say. And when they tried to gain control of the Hulk, which is a terrible idea, his father was killed in action. Again, terrible idea, don't fight the Hulk. So Miguel wanted to learn more of his father in the Legion, so he broke into the Legion's headquarters, and while he was snooping around, one of the machines turned on, and he turned into a living energy. Now, he almost joined the Great Lakes Avengers at one point, but only because he thought GLA meant Gay Lesbian Alliance. I don't think Great Lakes are as exciting, but you never know. We have one over here, it's Lake Ontario. It's way too cold and smelly. I would much rather gay lesbian alliances. The team had the worst luck when it came to recruits. Let's just say that. Number four, Stingray. Walter Newell made his comic book debut in Tales to Astonish issue 95. Now his life began as an oceanographer and an engineer. And once he created, 
and once he created a suit built for deep sea exploration, a cool nickname was bound to come afterwards. Stingray, there it is, that's a cool nickname. He was ordered to bring in Namor to investigate the disappearance of water from our oceans. He ended up working with Namor numerous times, water bros for life, and then he joined the team as a reserve member in the Avengers issue 319. Funny enough, in the Armor Wars storyline, Iron Man wanted to recover all these suits that had Stark tech in it. So he comes in, knocks out Stingray, and then after attaching the negator pack, nothing happened. So the suit was indeed not stolen. You know, it's always nice when you knock someone out for no reason. I'd love to see him make an appearance in the Armor Wars Disney show, but I think we need a lot of other stuff first before we even look at Stingray. Although he is cool. Number three, Jack of Hearts. Jonathan Hart, son of Philip Hart, a brilliant scientist who developed the liquid called Zero Fluid, and his mother was actually part of the Contraxian race. Now, the alien woman was also a scientist sent to discover this energy source to help their dying Contraxian son. Now, the alien lady heard about Philip Hart's experiments, so they met, got married, and then out came Jack. And then later on, when Jack was a teenager, his father had completed the zero fluid, but was sadly killed by the agents of a criminal corporation who wanted the fluid for themselves to market it. Classic bad guy stuff. Give us your fluids. Let's fight. So when Jack hid in his father's lab, he was covered in said zero fluid. And then he started to glow and change and become more powerful becoming the Jack of Hearts. Energy was just oozing out of his body. He handled his father's killers easily after that. He then joined the Avengers in volume three, issue 43. Number two, not one, but two guns. He's got two guns, the two gun kid. Let's talk about him. Of course, we can't forget this rootin' tootin' Avenger. Look out, gang, here he comes. Matt Hawk joined the team in Avengers 142. This guy's fun. Now, the cover alone, let's talk about this. The Avengers versus the wild Western heroes of all. Let's go, I'm gonna read this right now. He was a Harvard-educated Boston lawyer who settled in 1870s Tombstone, Texas after the Civil War. Like the Civil War, not Civil War, like the Civil War, you get it? I don't really have to pitch what his life was pre-Avengers. I mean, there's horses, there's shooting, there's lots of nice boots. One day he saved the life of this elderly man. He was getting picked on by a rootin' tootin' gang. But this man just happened to be legendary gunslinger, Ben Dancer. It's Ben Dancer. So Ben is exactly what you'd imagine in your head. I read all of his lines in Sam Elliott's voice because, well, of course I did, look at him. So he, of course, trained Matt. And then when the Avengers fought Kang back in that era, so once the dust had settled, literally, the dust had settled, the two-gun kid came back to the modern era with the team. And Hawkeye had a pretty good time as well. This is when he started to dig the West Coast life. He wanted to leave the Avengers, because being a bow and arrow man made more sense to be out there than Manhattan. I, I have to agree. And finally, number one, we can't forget about him, the Forgotten One. Gilgamesh made his first appearance in Eternals issue 13. He was born before the Ice Age, and in 3000 BC, the Eternal became Gilgamesh, king of Uruk in Sumeria. In ancient times, he would wander the earth battling tyrants and taking down beasts. He would fight alongside Hercules and even took down the demon dragon zoo. He fought for the Roman Empire as a centurion, just taking out tribes left and right. And then he joined the Avengers in issue 300. And currently he works alongside Hercules and the gods of war. Now I feel like we're gonna see this guy soon in the MCU, I mean the Eternals movie, Thor, Love and Thunder, bringing in some gods. Yeah, the forgotten one, no more. I have a feeling. And it said Midnighter. Midnighter, alongside his future husband Apollo, was part of the top secret Stormwatch team created by the first Weatherman, Henry Bendix. Nobody but Bendix himself knew of the team's existence. Bendix built them as superhumans, and when they donned their costumes and spoke their code names, their previous identities ceased to exist. Midnighter has the power to predict how a situation will happen before it starts. This allows him to run through a given situation millions of times in his mind, instantly covering every possible result before his first move is even made. He uses this information to predict the actions and or reactions of others, counteracting their moves almost before they even think to make them. Effectively making Midnighter the greatest tactician in the history of mankind. Basically the good guy version of the thinker. That's that's pretty cool. He could he could be Batman just because he knew every single way it would happen. And at nine, the Atomic Knight. The Atomic Knights appeared in every third issue of Strange Adventures in the early 1960s, beginning with number 117 and running through number 160. In all, there were 15 early 1960s Atomic Knight stories created by writer John Broom and artist Murphy Anderson. They were a band of heroes living in and protecting the post-apocalyptic future of 1992. <laughs> yep, at that point it was the future. Following 
following the catastrophic Hydrogen War of 1986. A petty tyrant named the Black Baron ruled a small section of the Midwestern United States with an iron fist. He was opposed by Sergeant Gardner Grail of the Atomic Knights, who wore medieval suits of armor that were impervious to the Baron's energy weapons, the armor having been irradiated in the war. Gardner Grail also has precognition, and wears a suit of armor that grants him enhanced speed, strength, endurance, and lets him blast energy, as well as being adaptable to other technology. And it ate Akrita. Andrea's father was Bernardo Rojas, once a renowned leader in Central America who researched pre-Hispanic cultures at a university in Mexico. She lived along with her cat named Zapata, named after one of the revolutionary leaders in Mexico. Akrata specialized in striking against organized crime. Every time she caught a perpetrator or helped advert a tragedy, she cited a literary quotation or, if she had the time, painted graffiti insulting or challenging the local authorities, which might hint at her being a bit of an anarchist, which honestly I'm kind of into. This character seemed to be kind of a Mexican Batman, and despite her anarchist tendencies, she often worked with another two Mexican superheroes, Iman and El Muerto. Together with these two allies and Superman, she once saved Mexico and the world from the total destruction from a bio um, bad guy group trying to channel the powers inherent to the ley lines of Earth to accomplish their goals. So good on ya, Andrea. Good on you. And it's seven jack o' lantern. The first jack o' lantern is Daniel Cormack of Ireland, who was born to a poor farmer who was granted a magical lantern by an Irish fairy. Yep, that's how we're going with this. Cormack is a member of the Global Guardians, an international group of superheroes. His first recorded mission in Super Friends number eight was to help Green Lantern dismantle a bomb in Ireland. Both Daniel Cormack and Marvin Noronza, the second jack o' lantern, have a mystical lantern that gives them the power of flight, flame projection, teleportation, illusion casting, enhanced strength, and the ability to just create. Fogs. The power of the lantern is also its weakest at noon and gradually increases until its peak at midnight. Liam McHugh, the third jack o' lantern, found a way to internalize the powers of the mystical lantern and no longer needs to carry it. So. Yeah. And it's 6 Apollo. Essentially the Wildstorm universe's answer to Superman, Apollo is now technically a part of the DC superhero universe, like Wildstorm ever since the two universes converged following the events of Flashpoint. Apollo possesses many of the same powers as Superman, but with a few notable differences. Like Kal-El, Apollo possesses superhuman strength, flight, and near invulnerability. If you want some clarification as to just how impervious the damage he is, he's able to walk on the surface of the sun. Apollo also has the ability to shoot lasers from his eyes, derived from solar energy. But unlike Superman, he can also release this energy from other parts of his body, including his hands and mouth. This dude can fire lasers from his mouth. He uses hyper beam in real life. His only real weakness is that he relies on the sun for his powers, so if he doesn't get enough exposure, his powers will diminish, but hey, at least Apollo isn't vulnerable to kryptonite. Halfway through in a number five swamp thing. In a secret facility located in the Louisiana swamplands, scientist Alec Holland and his wife Linda invented a bio-restorative formula that would solve any nation's food shortage problem. Ferret and Bruno, thugs working for Nathan Ellery, barged into Alec's lab, knocked him out, and planted a bomb in the facility. Alec woke up just as the bomb exploded, and in the flames, he ran into the swamp. His body had been drenched in the bio-restorative formula, and this affected the plant life of the swamp, imbuing it with Alex's consciousness and memories. The newly conscious plant life then formed a semblance of a human form and rose up from the bog as the swamp thing. The latest in a long line of Earth elementals created when the green was in need of protection. His body is composed of sentient vegetable matter, he has the ability to nourish himself, superhuman strength, elemental control, chlorokinesis, astral protection, biofission, immortality, regeneration, size alteration, resurrection, you name it, and Swampy can do it. Swampy away! And in four, Mr. Miracle. Mr. Miracle was Scott Free, the god of escape in the New Gods mythology. A Genesian raised on Apocalypse, he defected with his lover Big Barda to Earth, where he used the skills he learned in Escapology, both as a performance artist and in the Justice League of America. Originally, the boy Scott Free was the son of High Father Isaiah, the ruler of New Genesis. However, as a part of a diplomatic move to stop a destructive war against the planet Apocalypse, High Father agreed to an exchange of children with his enemy Darkseid. In doing so, he surrendered Scott Free to the care of his enemy while he received his enemy's son, Orion. This guy has new god physiology, okay, making him immortal, super strength, super durable, and giving him super agility. Plus, when utilizing his full godly potential, Mr. Miracle wields a cosmic energy field called Alpha Effect, which allows him to transverse through time and space, heal living beings, fully restore creatures back from death, and control energy to an almost boundless degree. Yep, 
You're on the list. Getting close to the end in at number 3, Jem, son of Saturn. After both his mother and teacher were killed by the White Martians, Jem stole a ship and escaped to Earth in search of his lover Syrah, who had fled there earlier. He arrives in Harlem, New York and is befriended by an orphan named Luther Mankin. After a series of adventures with and without Luther, Jem eventually found Syrah. They all then traveled to New Bok, a red Saturnian colony, but because he refused to take sides in his civil war on New Bok, Jem was disavowed and cast out by both factions. Dispirited, Jem and Luther return to Earth, and given that Jem is a form of Martian in a sense, his Saturnian physiology gives him flight, metamorphosis, physiokinesis, telekinesis, telepathy, energy projection, superhuman durability, superhuman stamina, and superhuman strength that allows him to match Martian Manhunter blow for blow. So I think this is a pretty worthy number three. And ultimately, in at number two, Karate Kid. Karate Kid is actually Val Armor, a superhero from the future and also a member of the Legion of Superheroes. He is a master of every form of martial arts to have ever been developed by the 30th century. The extent of his skill was so great that he could severely damage various types of hard material with a single blow, and was briefly able to hold his own against Superboy through the use of what he called Super Karate. So he already seems pretty legit. Val Armor was the son of Japanese greatest crime lord Kiaru Nozumi, also known as the Black Dragon. When he was born, his mother, an American secret agent known as Valentina Armor, tried to hide him from his father, but she failed to do so and was killed for her affront. Japan's biggest hero, Sensei Toshiaki, and the White Crane, eventually killed the Black Dragon for his crimes and then adopted the infant Val. He raised Val as if he were his own son and trained him in all manner of martial arts. Val became the youngest warrior ever to earn the title of samurai and he went on to work for his local shogun. However, after trying his best and failing to please his supervisor, he quit and searched the galaxy for new forms of battle to master. That just goes to show you, people, appreciate your employees, otherwise they're going to quit and go search the galaxy for new forms of martial arts, okay? And finally, in at number one, Blue Beetle. Jamie Reyes was a relatively normal high school student from El Paso, Texas. His father ran a garage and his mother was a paramedic, and he had a little sister who was a total brat. Jamie hung out with his two best friends, Brenda and Paco, and he acted as like the mediator between the hardworking Brenda and the laid back Paco. By both Brenda and Paco's accounts, he was a good friend, the kind of person who could just let them be themselves and would always make things better. Jamie aimed to help his father out in the garage, but Alberto turned him down, not wanting to see his son grow up too fast. Ted Cord, the second Blue Beetle, had come into possession of the Blue Beetle Scarab, the artifact which had given Dan Garrett the first Blue Beetle his powers. The Scarab had been presumed destroyed early in Ted's superhero career, but it was discovered intact in a pyramid in the Middle East. This is where Jamie gets his powers as well. What are those powers, you ask? The Scarab can and will use its powers of its own accord. Jamie, however, can override the Scarab if need be. And should Jeremy fall prey to mind-altering power, the Scarab will take control of the armor. So it will act on its own, and basically he's not mind control anymore because it's just the Scarab doing it, not actually him. And we'll move on to number 10, which is... Firestorm. Ronnie Raymond was a jock of a high school student who was also, funnily enough, an environmentalist. When Ronnie showed up to protest the opening of a new nuclear plant, he met Dr. Martin Stein, a Nobel Prize winning physicist who worked there. When the Firestorm Matrix reactor malfunctioned thanks to one of Ronnie's compadres, Stein and Raymond were both caught in the radioactive aftermath and somehow found themselves fused together into Firestorm the Nuclear Man. Now, they are a being with two minds sharing the same body, usually with Raymond taking the lead. Alongside the rather unique one man with two minds thing, Firestorm also gained the ability to transmute any non-organic matter having complete control control over molecules. With this ability, he can do many, many things. Flight, phasing, regeneration, self-sustenance, strength, durability, shape-shifting, energy projection, and absorption and density manipulation. All of which, as you know, make for an incredibly powerful individual. Number 9, Vixen. Mary McCabe, who is the superhero known as Vixen, is also a successful fashion icon, talk show host, and animal activist, who is able to channel the powers of any animal that has walked or evolved 
on Earth through the mystical object given to her ancestor by the god Anansi called the Tantu Totem. Originally, it was the Tantu Totem that gave her her abilities, but over time, it has been changed. The totem actually just helps hone said abilities. Basically, Vixen has a strong connection to the Red, which is a magical thingy that connects all animal life in DC Comics. A few other characters also share a connection to the Red, but I think Vixen is definitely one of the coolest. Normally, she uses this power for flight and to enhance her speed, strength, senses, and healing abilities. But she has also sometimes used the poisonous abilities of certain animals and has even been seen to fully transform into animals. Vixen's ability is so wide that she can use the light of an anglerfish to create powerful lasers, use the armor of armored beetles to withstand a punch from Superman, and she can even create a force field using just the energy from the red itself. Number 8. Blue Beetle The Blue Beetle Scarab is what gives this hero their powers. I say there because the Blue Beetle has been multiple people over the years. Dan Garrett and Ted Cord were the first, with the most recent Blue Beetle being Jamie Reyes. And he will also be the one featured in the DCEU, so I'm gonna mainly focus on him. Sorry. Once the Scarab latches onto Reyes' spine, it can manifest various powers. When he's in danger, the Scarab automatically activates and encompasses him in a high tech suit of blue, beetle like armor. This suit provides Reyes with superhuman durability and strength, flight with wings that spread out of the back, and speed with rocket boosters. It can also translate both human and alien languages for Reyes. The suit's durability is so high that it is bulletproof and allows Reyes to survive the heat of a rocket launch, re entering Earth's orbit, and even explosions. The suit can also produce energy blasts from its hands that are powerful enough to discharge Kryptonian radiation and neutralize magic, which, if you don't know, both of those things are quite the feat. The suit can also construct objects out of nanotechnology as well as transform itself into nearly anything. The suit has transformed itself into anything from swords and cannons to a staple gun, which could probably be pretty useful, I think. It can manipulate alien technology and apparently has access to WMDs that are apparently capable of taking out the Spectre. So yeah, don't sleep on Blue Beetle. Number 7. Red Tornado Originally, Red Tornado was an android created by the supervillain T.O. Moro, whose name I absolutely hate. But he was made to infiltrate the Justice Society of America. But since then, the android has, well, he's become more than an android, but he's also become a noble superhero and a pretty gosh darn powerful member of the Justice League. Red Tornado basically is an air elemental housed in an android shell. He can create powerful air currents powerful enough to level skyscrapers in seconds. He channels air and wind forces through his arms and legs to produce bursts of cyclone strength winds and high speed forward velocity flight. He can also absorb air, which I mean we all absorb air when we breathe, so it's kind of weird, but Red Tornado is also super strong and very durable, enough so that he or it can take a missile straight on and come out completely unharmed. A few times Red Tornado actually managed to become invisible to the human eye due to his high velocity movement and surprisingly not because he's an elemental. His android form also gives him resistance to various mental powers. He's very cool but unfortunately not as popular as he should be. Number 6. The Ray Raymond Terrell was apparently born with a condition that didn't allow him any exposure to sunlight. Or at least, that's what he had been told. It turns out Ray had been lied to. In reality, Ray's real father was Happy Terrell, a World War II hero known as the Ray. So it turns out Raymond was born with tremendous superpowers that only awaken with light exposure. Upon discovering his new powers, he actually went invisible for about four years, before saving a friend, turning the assailant invisible, and then restoring them to scare the bejesus out of him. Ray is a being of light and has many abilities as a result. Once his body absorbs natural light, like sunlight or artificial light, he can direct the energy to rearrange molecules into any form, matter, or energy. With the projected energy, he can fly, project rays, beams, and bolts of destructive light, and create constructs out of pure light similar to how a green lantern can do it. Obviously, he can bend light to make himself or others invisible, but he can also do a similar thing in order to create illusions. And after consuming light energy, he can sustain himself off of it, not needing to eat or drink. Number 5. Metamorpho Rex Mason was a globe-trotting adventurer and archaeologist who encountered the Orb of Ra on one of his journeys 
journeys. This orb mutated him just a little horribly, but alongside the mutations, it also gave him the power to convert his body into any element. You ask me, that's a pretty fair trade off. I, I would take it. Using the power to shape shift his body into various forms using the elements, he became a hero. Now, Rex can stretch, bounce, elongate, control, and reshape his body as if it were made out of rubber or plastic. He can alter the shapes and consistencies of the elements he becomes and even combine them to form complex compounds. He has biofission, meaning that Rex can split his body into several copies of himself, each with the same powers. And lastly, he has a naturally occurring body armor, but it's a little redundant because although Metamorpho's powers allow him to fight against evil, they also are a curse, keeping him trapped in a hideous form unable to even die. He's not hideous, honestly. People are just kind of judgmental. Number four, Stargirl. Starting off as Star Spangled Kid of the team Stars and Stripes with her stepdad, Pat Duggan, after joining the JSA, Courtney Whitmore is given the Star Rod when Jack Knight decides to quit being Starman. To continue his legacy, eventually she officially declares herself as Star Girl. Now, as Star Spangled Kid, Courtney used the Cosmic Converter Belt, which enhances a number of Courtney's abilities, such as her agility, durability, speed, stamina, and strength, as well as allowing her to create Star Blast from the stored energy of of the belt. When she became Stargirl, she still kept this belt, but now she's using the Star Rod, which allows her to fly as well as absorb energy which she can project into various uses, such as blasts and force fields. Also, because the rod is attuned to her, it can receive mental commands from a distance, so she can do multiple different things here. Pretty good. Number three, Aztec. Okay, since we are talking about a character who has a lot to do with Aztec mythology, I will 110% mess up some pronunciation here. Just a forewarning. Uno, the man who would become Aztec, was trained from birth by the mysterious Q Society, which is a secret organization dedicated to providing a champion for Quetzalcoatl. His mission is to prepare for the eventual second coming of the dark god Tezcatlipoca. To help with that, Aztec's power comes from the Mask of Warriors, which has been handed down from warrior to warrior over the generations, with their consciousness becoming one with the Mask, meaning Aztec can call upon the experience of his predecessors in any situation, which is incredibly helpful. The helmet bestows its wearer with a variety of abilities other than that though, including enhanced audio and visual systems like x-ray and infrared vision. It protects the wearer, increasing physical strength, and will even transfer full motor control over to the helmet if the wearer becomes unconscious. The armor can camouflage itself, turning it invisible or reducing the wearer's molecular density. The gauntlets contain energy blasters located in the palms and launchers hidden in the wrists that can shoot wire nets, cables, or mini rockets. Kind of like Iron Man, the armor's chest piece acts as a power battery for the suit and also allows the venting of highly destructive energy that can destroy a whole city block. The suit also allows him to fly and allows Aztec to travel through space. It also looks super cool. Number two, Mr. Miracle. Mr. Miracle was Scott Free, who is the god of escape in the New Gods mythology. So that's already a high level of praise. A Genetian raised on Apocalypse, Scott and Big Barda left for Earth where he used the skills he learned in escapology, both as a performance artist and in the Justice League of America. So, obviously as a new god, he has immortality, super strength, durability, and agility, but the fun part is his escapology. Scott can basically escape from most things, even in his sleep, and no, I'm not joking. He is aware of the unconscious procedures he's mastered and can modify them in their use with other skills to use new knowledge. He's also very proficient when it comes to making traps. It may not seem like an incredibly useful ability, but it is certainly unique and can be used in more instances than you may think, especially when on a team like the Justice League. And in at number one is the Phantom Stranger. First appearing in the first issue of his own self-titled comic all the way back in 1952, the Phantom Stranger is an immortal to the extent of even surviving having his own heart taken out of his body. The Phantom Stranger is a mysterious supernatural guide and specialist in the occult. He can travel across space and time at will, even to magical dimensions, including the realm of the just dead, the antechamber of souls, heaven, hell, apocalypse, and the realm occupied by the quintessence. 
All of which is something very few Justice League members can actually do. There's a lot that is just kind of not known about this character, which is a purposeful thing, but it's a really annoying thing for making a video on him on YouTube. In the New 52, he is apparently Judas Iscariot, roaming the earth trying to make up for the guilt of betraying Jesus. I don't know where that came from, it just kind of is the way it is. He is one of the most powerful magic users in DC Comics, with his use of magic being almost unmatchable if not taken by surprise. Number 10, Our Man. Now I'm sure we can all name a handful of heroes of super strength, but some heroes just aren't lucky enough to be born with it or just haven't been under the right circumstances to gain them. However, in the DC Universe, there is actually a pill that you can take to make yourself stronger, faster, more durable, and just more adaptable for exactly one hour called Miraclo. Put a little more scientifically, the active ingredient in Miraclo is a special form of phosphorus, which bonds temporarily with the ATP and muscle cells to create an adenosine quad phosphate, which energizes the cells. With this pill, the vigilante known as Our Man was able to fight crime. Now there have been two men that have taken up the Hour Man mantle, so let's just briefly go over both of them. Rex Tyler was the original Hour Man and the scientist who actually created Miraclo, he used it to fight against crime during the Golden Age. Despite being an average human in every way, he was able to fight alongside the Justice Society and the Freedom Fighters thanks to this drug. And then his son Richard Tyler took up the mantle after his father's retirement, taking the Miraclo pills against his father's wishes in order to save Rex and then his fellow Justice Society members as well. Now despite his strength, Our Man was never anything close to the powerhouse like Superman. Honestly, he wasn't even ever the strongest member of his own team, but he sure could throw a punch in that one hour window and that is why he's on this list today. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1940's Adventure Comics number 48. Number 9, Tanga. A pretty obscure character in the DC Universe, so don't feel too bad if you're not familiar with her. Tanga is a cosmic being whose only real goal is to search for simple pleasures throughout the cosmos, which is just super wholesome and I love it. She was introduced to us in the comic miniseries World Worlds by Kevin McGuire and though she talks about having met Lobo and other members of the Green Lantern Corps before, we've never actually seen the character interact with anyone else, making us wonder if she's just making it all up. Although we don't know much about her abilities or powers in terms of raw power, she certainly deserves her spot on this list today. When we first met her, she starts out as the guardian of the planet Chimera and spends her time defeating monsters to protect the people there. She doesn't know her own strength though, which means she lacks the fine control necessary to master her powers, what, whatever they may be. Check her out for yourself in her first appearance in 2011's Weird Worlds, Volume 2, Number 1. Number 8, Ultra Boy. In the far future of the 30th and 31st century, young heroes from around the universe banded together to form the Legion of Superheroes. We know about members like Cosmic Boy, Lightning Lad, Saturn Girl, and Brainiac 5, but when the team needs some muscle, they call upon Jonah of Rimbor, more commonly known as the superhero powerhouse Ultra Boy. Out of all the Legionnaires with all their different powers, he is one of the strongest characters on the team. While many of these characters use the natural abilities of the race to protect the citizens of the United Planets, Ultra Boy received his powers from exposure to radiation thanks to prolonged exposure to an energy beast. He has been shown to have all the same abilities as Superman, but he is so low on this list today because he can only use one of those powers at a time. He has the strength to rival the Man of Steel himself, but given the limitation of his abilities, Ultra Boy has a huge weakness. However, despite this, he remains one of the most useful members of the team. Check out Ultra Boy for yourself in his first appearance in 1962 Superboy number 98. Number 7, Loose Cannon. Back in the early 1990s, DC Comics used the Bloodlines crossover as, as an excuse to create a ton of new superheroes and villains. These new bloods were given powers when alien parasites attacked them, resulting in the creation of the superhero team The Blood Pack and heroes like Hitman, Gunfire, and many others. Eager to have its own version of the Hulk, DC introduced the character Loose Cannon, who was a cop by the name of Eddie Walker before he gained incredible superpowers that made him seem destined for the spotlight. Similar to the Hulk, Eddie takes on a massive form when he gets angry, however, Unlike his counterpart, Loose Cannon has several stages to his transformation. When he initially gets angry, his skin turns blue, but as he gets madder, it changes color. The next stage is purple, followed by red, until finally his skin is completely ghost white to match the white, hot rage he feels inside. In his most powerful form, Loose Cannon becomes uncontrollable and is unable to put together a coherent thought, which is absolutely terrifying because we have seen what characters like that can do. Check out this colorful beast of a hero for yourself in his first appearance in 1993's Action Comics Annual, number 5. Number 6, Damage. Were you hoping for back-to-back -back DC Hulk clones on this list today? Well, I hope so because that is pretty much what damage is. In an attempt to create its own super-powered soldiers, the military conducted tests using Dark Matter energy left over from the Dark Knight's Metal event. The result was Ethan Avery, who gained the ability to transform into a giant, super-powered form for exactly one hour. Just how strong is damage? Well, it's been heavily implied that he is much stronger than Superman himself. 
Even given just one hour, the monster has proven able to make easy work of modern military weaponry like tanks and aircrafts, and on top of that, he has defeated the Suicide Squad, Poison Ivy, and even proved to be too much for someone like Wonder Woman to handle. After the two fought in the streets and Diana took a serious beating, she told Batman and Superman that Damage could be the strongest opponent she has ever faced, which would actually include the Man of Steel himself. Hopefully one day we get a fight between the two so we can see just how much stronger he is than Superman. Give Damage Story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 2017's Dark Days of the Casting, number one. Number five, Atom Smasher. Now most superheroes with increased strength are disproportionately sized compared to the insane abilities that they're shown to have. Like, sure, Superman can lift an entire building over his head, but does he really look like a dude who can practically do anything he sets his mind to? Yeah, that's what I thought. Frequent Justice Society member Al Rothstein changes that up a bit because he has the ability to grow in size and can alter his density and strength directly proportional to that size. Meaning, if he's 60 feet tall, he is going to have the abilities a human being would have if they were that size. Even at his normal height of 7 foot 6, Adam Smasher has been shown to be a formidable foe for anyone who crosses his path. He's capable of just plucking a jet plane out of the sky with ease, and can compete with just about any other superpowered person that comes to mind. Adam Smasher has put up a fight against the likes of Power Girl, Solomon Grundy, Martian Manhunter, Black Adam, and even fought off the Spectre once. Al also took the young hero Grant Emerson, aka The Other Damage, under his wing while the kid was trying to figure out himself, and even he, with his own super strength, couldn't match up to Adam Smasher, who easily pinned him down with one hand and just straight up knocked him out. Check out Adam Smasher's ridiculous strength through yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1983's All-Star Squadron, number 25. Number four, Infinity Man. Now the identity of Infinity Man varies, but regardless of who is underneath that mask, he is always one of the most powerful warriors of the members of New Genesis. There have been at least three Infinity Men throughout DC Comics, the first being Astor, who passed on his powers to Drax, the older brother of Darkseid. And then the third is the primary incarnation of the character named Isaiah, who is the combined form of all of the Forever People. This most recent version of the character is one half of High Father, after the leader of New Genesis had gone to the Source Wall seeking answers for the war between him and Darkseid, and found the compassionate half of himself stripped away completely. This kinder and compassionate half is the one that became Infinity Man, and thanks to his new god physiology, he possesses basically all the abilities of Darkseid and the other new gods, and uses his powers for good. The original Infinity Man was created by the legendary Jack Kirby, Check out the original incarnations in 1971's Forever People number 1, or take a look at the new 52 Infinity Man in 2014's Infinity Man and the Forever People number 2. Number 3, Big Barda. The new gods of New Genesis and Apocalypse are some of the most powerful cosmic entities in the universe. Now they may all pale in comparison to the likes of Darkseid, but each has their own levels of strength and unique abilities. One of the most powerful among these new gods is Big Barda, who is trained at a young age to be a member and eventual leader of Darkseid's elite warriors, the Female Furies. She eventually rebelled against her controllers, escaped Apocalypse, and joined the new Genesis. Big Barda and Mr. Miracle are now married and living happily together on Earth, but that does not mean that they shy away from a fight when they have to. Over the years, Big Barda has shown herself to be one of the fiercest warriors in the DC Universe as her strength and fighting skills rival the abilities of Wonder Woman. She can overpower her former teammates and has defeated the likes of Knockout and Calabac in one-on-one -on -one combat. Her husband may be remembered as the world's greatest escape artist, but it's really Barda who holds the power in this relationship. In the past, Big Barda had served under the Justice League of America, proving that she can stand side by side with the world's greatest heroes, but sadly she dies at the hands of Infinity Man. However, at the end of Final Crisis, she is seen with a newborn Regenesis, so we're all kinda confused to what's going on with her now. Give her story a read for yourself, starting with her first appearance all the way back in 1971's Mr. Miracle, number four. Number two, Orion. The biological son of the villainous Darkseid, Orion is an elite level warrior and seems to be the only other new god who can actually physically harm Darkseid in any meaningful way. Representative of the constant struggle of nature and nurture, Orion struggles to control his rage and inner brutal nature, but he's still considered to be one of the greatest and most powerful allies of New Genesis. Orion also has the benefit of his Astro Harness, capable of harnessing energy directly from the source itself that he calls the Astro Force. On multiple occasions, he is shown to be as strong as the likes of Superman and Wonder Woman, and this was further proven with the biggest achievement he has on his resume, the fact that he was actually the one who finally took out Darkseid himself. 
With the elimination of the new gods in the lead up to Final Crisis, the final two members of this cosmic race of gods fought it out in the streets of Earth. Orion finally dug deep in himself and became the monster he had always tried to stop himself from being and managed to battle Darkseid to a standstill. However, that all changed when the sun destroyed the father and he ripped out Darkseid's heart directly out of his body in just one foul swoop. He was unfortunately killed during Final Crisis though with a Radeon bullet. However, he was resurrected later on Earth alongside the rest of the new gods. Check out Darkseid's Sons for yourself in his first appearance all the way back in 1971's New Gods, number one. And number one, the Spectre. The most powerful being in the DC Universe by far has to be the Spectre. As God's spirit of vengeance, he is blessed with all sorts of powerful magical abilities, but it's his raw strength that really sets him apart from everyone else. The power of the Spectre is so great that it actually needs a human host in order to be kept in check. Jim Corrigan, Hal Jordan, and Christmas Allen have each taken control of the spirit of vengeance in order to enact his own version of justice onto the world. Over the years, we've seen the Spectre's amazing abilities, like how he's essentially invulnerable to all physical attacks, Unless you're Batman, that one time Spectre allowed him to hurt him. That was a weird sort of storyline, I don't know. This magical entity also has the ability to take out the entire magical community in one fist fight at a time. We're talking defeating Shazam with literally just one punch to the face. He's also seen capable of wrangling the Red Lantern Avatar of Rage, known as the Butcher, with just his bare hands. His most impressive feat, though, would have to be the time he engaged the Anti-Monitor in hand-to-hand -hand combat and was able to overpower him for control over all of creation. The heroes needed his power in Crisis on Infinite Earths, and he delivered in a very big way, saving all of reality from the brink. Check out this all-powerful being for yourself in its first appearance in 1940's More Fun Comics, number 52. Number 10, Animal Man. Buddy Baker was once a punk rocker who was chosen to be the protector of the red, aka the web of life, aka the morphogenetic field, which, put simply, is the force that binds all living things on Earth together. From then on, Buddy discovered that he was able to absorb the abilities of any animal anytime he was in the presence of it, and he could summon those abilities at will, using them to fight crime and whatnot. These abilities include the strength of a T-Rex, the flight of a bird, the speed of an ant, the sonic blast of a pistol shrimp, the stench of a skunk, and just a whole lot more. Donning his iconic orange and blue costume and calling himself Animal Man, Buddy has teamed up with the Forgotten Heroes and the Justice League on multiple occasions to help take down Vandal Savage, Queen Bee, the Time Commander, and more. Now the biggest struggle in Buddy's life, however, is that he is both a family man and a superhero, and he often finds it pretty hard to strike a balance between the two. Check out Animal Man for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1965's Strange Adventures number 180, or feel free to skip ahead to his prime Earth counterpart, starting with 2011's Flashpoint volume 2, number 5. Number 9, Gotham Girl. Claire Clover, aka Gotham Girl, was half of the metahuman crime fighter duo that fought to protect Gotham City. Now it's not really explained how or when, but Gotham Girl received her powers after purchasing a set of metahuman powers that are now tied to her life force. And the strength of her powers is determined by how much life force she is willing to sacrifice to use them, meaning more life force equals crazy strong powers. However, this was later resolved when Batman exposed her to some platinum kryptonite. These powers include superhuman strength and stamina, flight, invulnerability, and some good old fashioned heat vision. She made her debut in Gotham alongside her brother by helping Batman save a plane that was hijacked by the Cobra Cult, and at that point Batman decided to take them both under his wing to train them as better heroes. After the death of her brother, she had a ton of trouble coping, but thankfully Batman was there to help her through it by letting her in on his own struggles in his own life. The worst thing she's ever done though that makes me even question if she's a hero was when she revealed to have been working alongside Bane, completely physically and emotionally breaking Batman. Check her out for yourself starting with 2016's DCU Rebirth number 1. Number 8, Captain Marvel Jr. Now it's no secret that superhero comics love bringing in a sidekick every now and then. After Batman got Robin in 1940, Captain Marvel was given Captain Marvel Jr. just a year later and as obscure as he might be compared to more famous sidekicks, he was known well enough by Elvis Presley that the king himself decided to model his onstage costumes after Captain Marvel Jr. Just as the wizard imbued Billy Batson with the power of Shazam, the captain imparted a portion of his powers to Freddy while he lay dying because of an accident that he caused. Now by saying the words Captain Marvel out loud, he gained all of the abilities that the original Captain has, just to a slightly lesser degree. In his human form, Freddy is forced to walk with a crutch due to a bad left leg, but as Captain Marvel Jr., he has full capabilities of his body, and then some. Now that is just the original CMJ who debuted in 1941's Wiz Comics number 25. The Freddy Freeman that debuted in DC's The Power of Shazam number 3 also has a pretty similar origin, however his powers were granted him directly from the six gods as opposed to getting them from Shazam. 
making him their direct champion. As a member of the Teen Titans, Justice League of America, and the new Young Justice, Freddy has helped take down some serious baddies, however his powers were robbed from him by Osiris, and since then, he has not been able to take the form of Captain Marvel Jr. Check out Freddy Freeman for yourself, and let me know what you think of him in the comments below. Number 7, Plastic Man. Originally a criminal who went by the name Eel O'Brien, Patrick O'Brien gained his malleable body after being shot and exposed to an unknown acid. When he woke up, he discovered that his entire body was elastic and it took him a while to get the hang of it, but eventually he was able to learn how to use his powers to his advantage. Partnered up with Woozy Winx, the two stopped an attempted robbery and from that point on, Patrick became known as the hero Plastic Man. Now not only can Plastic Man stretch himself at will, he can also increase or decrease his size, posing as a tiny little action figure or growing to the size of a building, and he can increase his own strength by growing or adding muscle mass to his body, and he can even shapeshift taking the form of basically anything that is impossible for humans to achieve without breaking every bone in their body. As an occasional member of the Justice League, Plastic Man not only became good friends with Batman, but he helped take down Clayface, Dr. Psycho, and played a rather large role during the Blackest Night storyline, fighting all of these zombified heroes and seemingly dying in the process. Check out his entire story for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1988's Secret Origins, Volume 2, Number 30, or feel free to skip ahead to his Prime Earth counterpart story, starting with 2011's Justice League International, Volume 3, Number 1. Number 6, The Phantom Stranger. The original Phantom Stranger was a mysterious figure whose origin and name have never been revealed. The Phantom Stranger is truly just an enigma. My favorite origin story for him is that he was originally a private citizen during the biblical times and was spared from God's wrath. An angel was then sent to deliver him from said divine wrath, and after questioning God's actions, he committed but the angel forbid his spirit from entering the afterlife, and reanimated his body and condemned him to walk the world forever, to be a part of humanity, but also forever separated from it. It was then he discovered his divine charge to turn humanity away from evil one soul at a time. Basically, his entire goal was to provide warnings for events that were on their way without actually intervening himself. These warnings were often very cryptic because of this since he's not allowed to directly stop anything. As an immortal with immense magical powers including, but not limited to, dimensional travel, spectral sight, transmutation, and energy blast, the Phantom Stranger has helped out the Justice League on multiple occasions and has inadvertently saved countless lives. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1952's The Phantom Stranger number 1, or check out his Prime Earth counterpart in 2012's Justice League Volume 2 number 6. Number 5, Mary Marvel. Fun fact, Mary Marvel has the distinction of being the very first female spin-off of a male superhero, making her debut in 1942's Captain Marvel Adventures Volume 1 number 18, predating Supergirl by more than a decade. Now just like her twin brother Billy Batson, she became involved with the world of wizards and magic words, and by calling out the name Shazam, she can take on the same powers as her brother. However, in many of their stories, it's explained that she, her brother, and Freddie Freeman all share a finite amount of power, meaning that the more heroes who use their abilities, the weaker they all are. Interestingly enough though, Mary has also received her powers from other sources outside of Shazam. Black Adam previously gave her his powers, making her prone to violence, and Darkseid further manipulated her powers to turn her into a purely evil entity, able to cut right through a human body without any remorse or resistance. In this form, she was able to overpower someone as strong as Wonder Woman. Honestly, it doesn't really matter where she gets her powers from, she is definitely a formidable foe, and more than deserves a spot on this list today. Now if you want to know more about this character, check her out in her first appearance, or feel free to skip ahead to a more recent story line in 1994's The Power of Shazam graphic novel. Number 4, Icon. Hailing from the planet Terminus, Augustus Freeman, aka Icon, was marooned on Earth in 1839 in the Deep South. He worked long and hard and was very involved in a lot of black history, but it wasn't until he met Raquel Irvin that he became Icon, the icon for the black community of Dakota City. Augustus is portrayed as a very intelligent and somewhat rigid person, and due to his upper class job as a big time lawyer and his quote unquote proper way of speaking, he is often criticized for being a sellout, which isn't true at all, he just likes to do things properly and by the book, you know? Thanks to his alien physiology, Freeman has superhuman strength, speed, agility, and stamina. He can also fly and is basically invulnerable and doesn't actually need any food or sustenance to survive. After seeing him use his powers, Raquel persuaded Augustus to become a superhero named Icon with herself as his sidekick, Rocket, thanks to the help of an inertia belt that allows her to manipulate kinetic energy. Throughout the majority of his series, Icon and Rocket do their best to take down these street thugs and criminals that gain powers after the Big Bang, which was a massive riot where quantum juice tear gas was thrown and gave superpowers to a vast majority of people. Check out the Icon and his series for yourself, starting with 1993's Icon number 1. Number 3, Zatanna. 
One of the greatest magic users in the DC Universe, Zatanna is the daughter of the legendary magician Zatara, and does all that she can to live up to his legacy and his expectations. She spends her nights working as a simple stage magician, you know, card tricks and all that jazz, and then her late nights working as a consulting sorcerer and a superhero. Typically to activate her spell, she speaks backwards, like for example, Tegroff would make someone forget something, Lay would heal any wound, you know, etc, etc. But that is all just for showmanship because she can actually cast her spells by speaking normally or with no words at all. And on occasion, she will write them down in her own blood. Aside from minor manipulations, Zatanna is also capable of complete elemental control, teleportation, altering reality, time travel, and a whole lot of other crazy stuff. Throughout the comics, we've seen her team up with the Justice League of America and the Sentinels of Magic to help take down the Secret Society of Villains, Eclipso, and so many more. Check out Zatanna for yourself in her first appearance in 1964's Hawkman No. 4, or if you'd rather see her prime Earth counterpart, check out 2011's Justice League Dark, Number one. Number two, Lon L. Did you know that Kryptonians aren't the only alien race that gain incredible superpowers with exposure to a yellow sun? Daxamites from the planet Daxam are actually an evolutionary offshoot from the people of Krypton, and much like their cousins, they gain all the abilities that Superman possesses on Earth. With that in mind, enter Mon L, a Daxamite hero who was inspired by Superboy. Mon L traveled to Earth when a young Clark Kent was still living in Smallville. When he was exposed to lead, his one and only weakness, Mon L had to be placed in the Phantom Zone to save his life. Thousands of years later, he was cured by Brainiac 5 and recruited into the Legion of Superheroes, where he has been considered one of the most powerful members just to date. He might not be quite as strong as his Kryptonian counterparts, but he has shown that he can take anyone from the Super Family in a fight, as he's wiped the floor with the likes of Supergirl, Superboy, and even the Man of Steel himself. After the establishment of New Krypton, Superman decided to live with his people, and he then trusted mon -El enough to entrust him with the city of Metropolis and a place in the Justice League. Check out his story for yourself in his first appearance in 1961 Superboy number 89. And number one, Captain Adam. Sentenced to death for a crime he didn't even commit, Captain Nathaniel Adam was offered a full pardon if he took part in an experiment involving an alien metal and a nuclear bomb. He accepted and instead of killing him, he survived the explosion and was blasted 18 years into the future and bonded with the metal to become Captain Adam. From that point on, he was basically a living nuclear reactor, meaning he could absorb and redirect energy, see electronic signals, and unleash massive energy blasts that can destroy cities, one of which was strong enough to destroy an entire universe. He can also change some physical properties of certain materials, turning arrows into butterflies, or even, you know, creating his own universe. Now that is just one iteration of Captain Adam, how about we take a look at the second, Alan Adam. Now Alan Adam was the character carried over to DC from the original Charlton comics series. Essentially a quantum Superman, Captain Alan Adam was born in a nuclear fire. Having his body reassembled with the aid of his atomically supercharged mind, he became a physical god on Earth. He has all the powers and abilities of Watchmen's Dr. Manhattan, and he was one of the few characters to survive Final Crisis, which I think just outright states how strong he is. Number 10, Count Vertigo. Now aptly named Werner Vertigo, he is a man who was born with an inner ear defect that affected his balance. So naturally he was implanted with a device that not only corrected that, but also gave him the ability to cause extreme vertigo in other people. That's right, his entire ability is disrupting his enemy's balance, and honestly you might think that's not really anything to write home about, but trust me, it is a lot more useful than you might think. Now Count Vertigo uses his ability to mess up the aim of even the best marksmen, to disrupt the guidance system of some of the most high-tech machinery, and even uses it to manipulate the emotions of people, causing them to flop between emotions like crazy. Now there are also two other Count Vertigos that fought against Green Arrow, but they use drugs to cause the same effects in their victims, and we are going to ignore them because using drugs is not cool. It's true, it's not cool. It's really not. Number 9, Calendar Man. Calendar Man to most people is just a guy who is obsessed with the date. But in reality, he is also one of the most accomplished villains. During his first appearance, he almost managed to defeat Batman, one of the greatest and smartest detectives in the world, straight out of the gate, by giving him an almost unsolvable problem. Calendar Man sent an anonymous letter promising to commit five crimes, one each day, each one corresponding to a particular season and theme, with the fifth day also being a clue as to the true identity of Calendar Man with the fifth season. Batman failed to capture Calendar Man on the first four days, often and arriving too late to the scene of the crime. And on the fifth day, it was only an ad for Calendar's Man's side hustle as a magician who was playing five days at the Bijou Theater in Gotham that allowed Batman to connect the dots. Where would Batman be without ads from the local newspaper? Local newspapers, they're important. They really are, you always gotta support local. Yeah. Number eight, Phobia. 
Quite possibly one of the most underrated villains in the DC Universe, Angela Hawkins III is Phobia, a member of the Brotherhood of Evil and constant enemy of the new Teen Titans that is capable of bringing your deepest and darkest fears to the surface. She basically uses psychic abilities to access the fear center of your brain and creates incredibly lifelike illusions that incapacitate pretty much everyone except for a select few who have been shown to be immune. Funnily enough, she is actually not immune to her own powers because she has some deep, dark insecurities and phobias hidden away as well, behind that, you know, tough exterior. And that was exploited by Raven in an attempt to convert her to the hero side of things. Obviously that didn't work though because since then, she has joined the Injustice League as a new member. Number 7, Giganta. You expect Giganta to be strong, of course, considering she is a gigantic woman, but I also feel like she's a villain that is more often than not forgotten by people. So while you might expect the strength to come along with her, you just wouldn't really expect her at all most days. Dora Zul was attempting to cure her rare blood disease that she was born with by experimenting on herself. Her mad scientist ways caused her to end up in a conflict with Wonder Woman and later caused her to also become the villain she is today. In the original continuity of New Earth, Dora subducted the body of a strong woman named Olga, putting her own consciousness into that body and gaining the ability to grow in size when her plot to steal Wonder Woman's body had failed her. Number 6. Automatopoeia. Now I personally love a good automatopoeia, but hey, I will take a bad one every now and then, and that is exactly what this villain is. He is a serial killer that specifically targets non-powered heroes, and he is so aptly named because he imitates the noises around him, such as his gunfire or the dripping water. He is also seen to be surprisingly durable for a human, able to take six arrows without slowing him down, and drop at least seven stories and just keep on running. Now this highly trained villain is one of the most clever out there, not only attacking Oliver Queen's son Connor, but fooling Batman so much that he reveals his own identity. And also in true villain fashion, he messed with Batman even further by killing his fiance Silver St. Cloud, slitting her throat while imitating the sound Batman's utility belt makes. Number 5, Punchline. Punchline is a newer villain on the scene and as such has definitely been underestimated. But honestly, it's this attitude that only serves to fuel Punchline's desire to prove that she is actually worthy of all of that hype. As far as we know, she is like Joker, a non-powered human being. Punchline typically fights with small stiletto blades and despite only being in a few issues so far, she has managed to slit Harley Quinn's throat and create her own specific brew of Joker venom just for Batman, which has succeeded in making him go pretty crazy recently. Imagining Alfred is still alive and still on his communique systems, despite the fact that, you know, he's very dead. Number 4, Amazo. A super deadly android designed by the insane in the membrane scientist Professor Ivo that acts as an enemy to the Justice League. Thanks to its synthetic body, Amazo is capable of replicating anything about a person in its general vicinity, including their powers and skills. So, you can probably understand why this android is so powerful and so dangerous. Amazo has been shown duplicating the powers and skills of Superman, Green Lantern, Zatanna, Black Canary, Elongated Man, and so many more, meaning his arsenal of powers to choose from is absolutely ridiculous. Not only that, he also has the ability to temporarily negate the powers of the hero that he's mimicking. So, for example, he could strip Superman of his powers for a finite amount of time and just pummel him into the dirt. That is absolutely insane if you ask me, and that is why he is on this list today. Number 3, Harley Quinn. In Batman the Animated Series, Harley Quinn unintentionally pissed off the Joker because she proved just how valuable of a partner in crime she was, and how capable she is as a villain without even the Joker's help, and has also done so with her pal Poison Ivy. Though of course Harley and Ivy just believed they had kidnapped millionaire Bruce Wayne at the time and made him take them on a shopping spree, but still, that's pretty impressive. While many also think that Harley is always moving closer to becoming more soft and more of a hero than a baddie, let's not forget when she executed one of the most villainous plots also without the Joker, killing tons of children across Gotham with free explosives that were disguised as video games, simply because she was bored and sort of feeling lost in terms of what to do with herself. So yeah, don't underestimate Harley Quinn. Number 2, The Reverse Flash. Eobard Thawne, one of the many, many speedsters that you'll find scattered throughout time and space in the DC Universe. Also known as Professor Zoom, this biggest Flash fanatic to ever live is capable of basically all the things that the Flash and his speed family can do. You know, like time travel, super speed, and electrokinesis. But what really sets him apart is his ability to completely negate another's connection to the speed force, effectively stripping his fellow speedsters of their powers and rendering them honestly useless. His most impressive feat though would probably be when he, you know, set the entirety of the New 52 in motion by creating the Flashpoint timeline. Almost every hero and villain dies in some gruesome death thanks to the circumstances of this new universe, and uh, yeah, that's pretty scary if you ask me. Number 1, Lex Luthor. Now when you boil it down, Lex Luthor is just a dude. 
He's just a bald dude who has a big beef with Superman. Whether that's because he doesn't like the fact that Superman's an alien, or he blames Superman for his hair loss, depending on the comics you're reading. The fact remains that his brilliant intellect puts him in the running to be one of the strongest, most powerful, and definitely most iconic Superman villains of all time. The fact that one, Luther is also a human who keeps one of the most superpowered heroes, Superman, on his toes, and that two, he managed to convince the country, despite being a supervillain, to vote him in as president are both pretty impressive. Number 10, James Gordon Jr., also known as X-Strike. James Gordon Jr. is a sociopath who in the New Earth continuity believed that empathy made you weak and set out to prove as much to Batman. While he is just a sociopathic murderer who enjoys hurting other people, James also happens to have a genius level intellect, which is obviously a pretty deadly combination. In the story Black Mirror, he set out to administer medication he had made to infants, which increases psychotic tendencies, a medication he himself was using supplementing the meds that would have helped to subdue those tendencies and calm those instincts within him. It took a while before the Bat family or the Gordons managed to figure out that something was not right when James returned. Although at least his dad, Commissioner Jim Gordon, had instincts that something was pretty much up right away and decided to follow those, which ultimately allowed James's plot to be uncovered and for him to be apprehended in the end. In the Prime Earth continuity, he was part of the Suicide Squad and was known for being their analyst. James also seems to be one of those villains who dies in stories but then always somehow comes back. I feel like he's done that at least a couple times, so although he's dead right now, he'll probably come back at some point. <laughs> If I was writing, I'd bring him back. I like I like James Gordon Jr. Number nine, Holiday. Holiday has to be one of the most unexpected villains in Batman and Gotham's rogue gallery, and an accomplished unexpected villain at that. Holiday was a serial killer who seemed to be targeting the criminal mob family known as the Falcones with his targets. However, then the Maroni family was also targeted, another massive crime family in Gotham. This created a lot of tension between Sal Maroni and Carmine Falcone, the head of both families respectively. However, in the end, Holiday wiped out not just many of the people and members of the Falcons, but also killed various members of the Maroni family as well, with the killings taking place on holidays. In the end, Batman and Jim Gordon managed to apprehend Holiday, but only after he had successfully killed Sal Maroni on Labor Day. Holiday turned out to be the youngest son of Carmine Falcone, Alberto, who wanted to prove himself and get revenge for being excluded from the family business. Although in reality, this was pretty much done to protect him. Wow, that's unfortunate. Holiday Holiday would later face off with Calendar Man and after being wounded would be smothered to death by his sister. Tragic. Number 8, Calendar Man. Well, of course I gotta put Calendar Man above since he beat Holiday and that's how it goes. For a guy that pulls off crimes inspired by different holidays, seasons, and calendar dates, Calendar Man can actually be surprisingly successful and terrifying. In his first encounter with Batman, Calendar Man managed to pull off four crimes successfully before he was caught. Aside from that, over the years, Calendar Man in the comics has taken his crimes to the next level, even going so far as to murder families as part of a Thanksgiving Day crime spree, sitting down to steal a plate of dinner after successfully wiping out an entire targeted family. That is pretty dark. Of course, Calendar Man's weakness tends to be similar to Riddler's, namely that he leaves clues as to how to capture him often, and we always know his crimes will revolve around notable days in the calendar, so makes it pretty easy to watch out for him. Like, is a holiday coming up? Well, we should probably watch out for Calendar Man. Number seven, Owl Man. Pretty much everything about Owl Man from Earth 3's crime syndicate is unexpected. He's the evil counterpart to Batman, but is not Earth 3's version of Bruce. Instead, he is Thomas Wayne Jr., who on his Earth was Bruce's older brother. He himself plotted to kill his parents as he believed they were mismanaging their wealth, which would, of course, end up being his inheritance. In the end, Bruce refused to help Thomas and even attempted to convince him to halt his plot. So Thomas Jr., saddened, was forced to kill his brother, having had much higher hopes for young Bruce. Thomas would then become Owlman and use a combination of fear, wealth, and influence to take control of Gotham. Still missing his brother, he decided to find someone to fill that that hole in his heart. After meeting Dick Grayson at the circus, Thomas orchestrated the death of his parents in secret and then offered him support and a home, manipulating him into becoming his sidekick, Talon. Yeah. Pretty shocking stuff. Number six, Hush. 
Hush has managed to pull off some of the most horrific schemes over the years and gotten under Batman's skin many, many times. And Catwoman's skin, even, when he literally stole her heart. Thomas Elliot is not only a powerful villain because of his intense vendetta against the Wayne family and Batman, but because he also is often shown to have the skill and strength to match Batman, as well as the cunning. He has taken Batman in hand to hand combat and fared surprisingly well, and he's managed to set into motion outlandish plots like impersonating Bruce Wayne by giving himself plastic surgery to make himself look nearly identical, then capturing and threatening the real Bruce Wayne with murder and disfigurement so that he could ultimately take his place. Number 5 Dark Side I know what you're thinking, but Amanda, none of us are surprised that Dark Side is super powerful. It's, you know, kinda his thing. I know, I know, I know Dark Side is super powerful. But remember earlier on when I said that some villains are simply surprising because they happen to go toe to toe with Batman at all? Well, Dark Side is one of those villains because he's just so powerful, it makes little sense that Batman would even be able to face him. I'm not knocking Batman here, by the way. Just acknowledging that he, at the end of the day, is just a very well trained, skilled, rich man in a bat suit. So, yeah. And yet, he has also managed to defeat Darkseid on more than one occasion, which is only even more unexpected and surprising. But I guess it's these unexpected storylines that we find so exhilarating and help to sell comics. So, when it comes down to why they were written, it actually makes a lot of sense. It's the unexpected matches that are the stories people get excited to write and fans get excited to read. Number four. Harley Quinn. Harley is just unexpected because of, well, I mean, where she started from in the Batverse. She was introduced in the Batman animated series as Joker's sidekick and girlfriend, and she became such a fan favorite that she was made a regular there, even though she was kind of intended to be a one off character, and would eventually make her way into the comics as well. From there, Harley's popularity meant we'd see her win all kinds of victories, or at least almost win them. And in the animated series, she'd also prove how dangerous she was when she came up with some of the most potential potentially successful schemes, which of course often irritated her partner in crime and her partner in life, Mr. J. Over the years, Harley has become so successful and powerful in fact that she has moved more and more away from being a villain and more towards heroic acts, with her now even becoming one of Batman's sidekicks in the comics. For a human, Harley is also shown being very strong, flexible, and durable in addition to being brilliant, often using her intellect or her unpredictable craziness to outsmart many of her opponents. Let's just remember that at one point she took on Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman all at once and was actually successful in that encounter. Number 3 Poison Ivy I mean, we all know how powerful Ivy is at this point, but it should also be acknowledged that initially she was just a student studying to be a botanist who ended up being used in her teacher's slash lover's twisted experiment. She then became something new, something deadly, the villain and creature we'd come to know as Poison and Ivy. Ivy was initially shown to be immune to all poisons and was interested in crime for basically the sake of status and power, able to use pheromones and kisses to influence her enemies. The power of seduction. <laughs> I don't know what this is. This is seduction, apparently. Since then, Ivy has come a long way at one point, even taking control of the whole world, controlling everyone's minds through plant life that they had consumed. She also became a full on terrifying eco terrorist, and since the very real and also fictional world of eco horror continues to grow, so does Ivy's power and presence in the comics, especially now that she's returned to her more traditional, villainous ways. Which is also kind of unexpected. She was down this hero path and then they were like, she's a villain again. I was like, huh? All right. Number two, karma. Just because you are considered a low level thug or in Fleet Delmar's case a supposed freedom fighter, doesn't mean you can't rise above your rank and become something greater. That is just what Fleet did. He ended up getting his hands on some alien tech that allowed him to move up to the next level when it came to his rank as a threatening and powerful Batman villain. He was supposedly apprehended by Batman years before, who had tormented him with fear gas as punishment for his crimes. It's pretty harsh, really. This experience apparently led to him losing his eyes and becoming blind, which is why he decided to seize the alien tech and use it to get revenge. The helmet he wore granted him psychic powers, allowing him to read the minds of his opponent and counteract their attacks easily in a fight. The helmet also allowed him to absorb energy blasts, which at one point allowed Karma to take on both Black Lightning and Batman at the same time. And then he went on to have a semi successful uh, career with the League of Assassins. So, I mean, he died, but still. 
pretty crazy for just like a, a low level thug in my opinion. Number one, Phantasm. Phantasm is of course unexpected given that she had a secret identity and in the animated series we even expected her to be a he instead of a she. So that's pretty unexpected. Andrea Beaumont is also one of those very powerful and strong villains for the fact that she holds a lot of sway over Bruce Wayne, being one of his love interests as well. Not only that but when it comes to many of her skills and her physical prowess she is often shown to match Batman and be on a very similar level to him, which is of course quite impressive because Batman is pretty crazy. Andrea is also surprisingly more ruthless in comparison to Bruce, having no qualms with killing those who cross her, whereas Bruce typically holds back from killing, at least in the current continuity. In his original days not so much. So not only does she potentially have him as an ally at times, but she also has all the skill, strength and know how to use their relationship and her knowledge of Bruce to her advantage when playing the role of antagonist. Starting off our list at number 10, we have the Diabolical Parasite. That's right, for the first entry on a list about power, we've got the supervillain whose entire gimmick is sucking it up. Born under the name of Rudolph Rudy Jones, the Parasite was born after accidentally ingesting a toxic substance at LexCorp that was eventually revealed to be the byproduct of extracted kryptonite radiation. This gave Rudy an unstoppable hunger and the ability to grow stronger by absorbing the life energy and super powers of anyone unfortunate enough to be his victim. The villain is impulsively drawn to those with the most power, and while he was initially more of a foil for the DC hero Firestorm, Superman's sun-based powers and incredible strength makes him the theoretical perfect feast for the Parasite. And judging by the amount of time that Superman has had to be saved at the last moment from Parasite to prevent himself from being completely sucked dry of his life energy, Parasite is definitely one of the more dangerous and hungry villains that Clark Kent should watch out for. Coming in at number 9 we have the one and only Bloodsport. Most well known for recently starring in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, Bloodsport was a young man who avoided his draft to Vietnam and fled to Canada, leaving his brother to die in his place. Driven mad by this unexpected turn of events, Bloodsport became an extremely talented mercenary who then became nearly unstoppable when he was gifted a device that allowed him to instantly summon any weapon he could imagine directly into his hand. Using this new gift, Bloodsport was nearly able to kill Superman by creating a gun that fired kryptonite bullets, a talent that leaves him pretty high up on the list of people considered dangerous by good old soups. Speaking of deadly kryptonite themed villains, at number 8 we've got the disturbingly gross monstrosity known as Cancer. But you know, spelled with a K because kryptonite. Cancer's origin story begins when Superman is poisoned with modified kryptonite by General Zod, leading to the growth of a kryptonite tumor within his body. While Superman's life was able to be saved by the efforts of Dr. Emil Hamilton and the rest of the Superman family, the discarded tumor was stolen again by General Zod's forces and mutated into a full-sized, xenomorph-looking creature with a life-killing aura and abandonment issues over how its father, Superman, forgot about it. Cancer is capable of wounding and breaking the skin of any Kryptonian, as he's essentially kryptonite itself in the flesh. And if you're literally poisoned to your arch enemy, I'd say that Superman had better watch out. Coming in at number 7, it's none other than Superman's twisted doppelganger, Bizarro. Now, honestly, when it comes directly to power levels, Bizarro should be a little bit higher on this list. When push comes to shove as an imperfect duplication of Superman made by Lex Luthor's duplication ray, Bizarro has comparable strength to his nemesis and has opposite versions of some of his more notable abilities. Freeze vision instead of heat vision, flame breath instead of freezing breath, and so on and so forth. However, Bizarro Bizarro also feels a strong calling to be more than just a twisted version of Superman, and over the years has become more of an anti-hero than an outright villain, and seems content to try and carve out his own little slice of paradise on his new planet, Bizarro World. Taking up a controversial spot at number 6, we have the one and only Lex Luthor, Superman's arch rival. Hating the idea of an alien having so much power and receiving so much love on planet Earth, Lex Luthor has been everything from a mad scientist to a ruthless businessman to even the President of the United States in his desperate quest, man, once and for all. He may be merely a human being, but with his dark intellect and lack of morals, Lex Luthor is more than capable of being noted as one of Superman's 
Batman's most powerful foes, whether he's inside a kryptonite fueled suit of armor or merely using his giant evil brain. Coming in at number 5 with another example of Superman's own power set being twisted and used against him, we have Superboy Prime. A jaded version of Kal-El from an alternate universe known as Earth Prime, this Superboy was the only superpowered hero on his own world, with all other heroes merely being fictional. After this reality was wiped out during the Crisis on Infinite Earths, Superboy Prime became obsessed with recapturing his past glory as the one and only Man of Steel, and slowly twisted into a psychotic version of Kal-El, determined to wipe out every other Clark Kent. Few thoughts are scarier in the DC multiverse than a rogue Superman determined to cross dimensions to get exactly what he wants. At number 4, we've got to go with Mongol, an intergalactic conqueror from the stars. One of the few non-Kryptonians in Superman's rogues gallery that could still survive coming to actual blows with him, Mongol is the charismatic leader of War World, a mobile battle station of a planet that travels the universe looking for planets to, naturally, wage war against. Training for a time with the Sinestro Corps, Mongol is one of the most skilled combatants and tactical adversaries that Superman has ever faced. And while he may be less known than the other intergalactic conqueror known as Darkseid, Mongol and his extended warlord family are a persistent thorn in Superman's side. Coming in at number 3, it's the Superman killer himself, Doomsday. Now I know what you're thinking. This is a list of Superman villains you wouldn't expect to be the most powerful, so how is the alien that's literally best known for killing Superman gonna count? Well, while Doomsday already does have an incredible reputation for killing Superman in the 90s, the character has only gotten more deadly, powerful, and unpredictable in the years since. Doomsday's most horrifying power is his ability to evolve and improve over any method that has defeated him in the past, an ability that has led to the creature becoming more and more intelligent with each encounter, and even exuding a toxin that's so powerful it was able to take out superpowered individuals like Wonder Woman. While Superman may have only died once to this Kryptonian monster, Doomsday is still biding his time for the rematch that'll finally let him get a second victory against the Man of Steel. At number 2, we've got yet another twisted version of Kal-El with the terrifying Ultraman. In the alternate universe of Earth 3, Superman's biological father was a far eviler man, and filled his infant son's spaceship with messages and monologues about his ideology and how Kal-El deserved to be the strongest possible being in the universe. Murdering his adoptive parents at the young age of only 7 after discovering that shards of his home planet, Kryptonite, made him stronger, this version of Superman instead took the name Ultraman, and wound up assassinating the President of the United States states before forming the Crime Syndicate, a dark doppelganger of the main DC Universe's Justice League. While other evil versions of Superman have been held back by mutations or outside intervention, Ultraman is Superman at his peak, but with none of the morals and nothing holding him back, meaning that every time he crosses over into another universe, Superman needs to stay on his guard. At our top spot on this list is the character I've been looking forward to pronouncing this entire video, it's Mr. Mixiez Pitalik. Superman's main two weaknesses throughout all of comics are kryptonite and magic, and while Mixiez Pitalik might not have much of the former, his magic is beyond compare. A being from the fifth dimension who enjoys tormenting the most powerful hero of our more basic 3D existence, Mixiez Pitalik's dimensional abilities essentially make him omnipotent with magic, allowing him to alter the rules of logic, reality, and capable of teleporting wherever he pleases. The only way to defeat him is usually by some made-up rule of his own decree, such as getting him to spell his name backwards, a spell that can send him back to his own dimension for a guaranteed 90 days. Definitely one of the oddest villains Superman has ever faced, Mixiez Pitalik is honestly more of a nuisance than an outright bad guy, but his limitless powers make us very grateful that he seems more focused on trickery than outright world domination. 